Hey, I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 24th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on a tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Present. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Yes, here. You have a quorum. Do we have any public speakers on the closed session item? I'm pulling up the list right now, and no, you do not have any speakers on the closed session item. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the item listed in the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. See you in a few.
Alex, if you can hear me, that worked like a charm. Okay, we are back. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 24th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand electronically, and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Present. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance mm -hmm. to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, nation one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. all right. May I have a closed session report? Eric Santi, members of the council, good evening. Council did commune a closed session tonight at 6 p.m. to discuss the appointment of a uh, your next city manager. The council had that meeting and ended it at 6.30. The council was about 6.20. The council took no reportable actions during the course of that meeting. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Cotty. May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Steve? You're, you're muted, Steve. I received a number of emails, and I think you guys did also, regarding a request to move item 5A up to the front end of the agenda. Uh, there's apparently a fair amount of trepidation of what's going to happen with this release, uh, and they'd like to get that some level of comfort that's going to happen. So if, if it's the council's pleasure, I've, I've got a bunch of calls and emails to do that. i got no problem doing that, but I'm not the only person making that decision. What position in the agenda are you are you talking about moving it to? Uh, right after we get to the consent after the consent calendar. So that would be before 4A. Yeah. For what it's worth, I probably got more emails on 4A than I got on 5A. So, yeah. you know, who wins? 4A is going to take some time, though. 5 days should be relatively quick if we do what we say we're, we say we're going to do so whatever that's worth I think there'll be a lot of public comment on both so I'm not yeah I don't know I don't know the answer <clears throat> I'll make a motion move it up see what happens Karen was Karen's motion to uh, approve the agenda seconded. I'll second it. Okay. So now the question is, is, is Karen willing to accept a friendly amendment, I think, along the lines of what Steve is proposing? In our meetings, there's no predicting how long any item will take. Um, and I'm willing to accept that. I, I apologize to everybody who wrote uh about 4a i got dozens and dozens of emails about that um and i hope those people don't mind sitting through another item to get to that one so can okay I, i'll accept it can i suggest a compromise yeah because i'm a little worried that some people aren't seeing this 
coming and so they won't be here in the right order so and i, I don't know. my my compromise would be to uh if we move 5a can we cut the people the comments to a minute apiece how many speakers do we have i have no idea Kelsey, how many do we how many speakers do we have signed up for 5A and how many speakers do we have signed up for 4A? At this moment, you have eight speakers signed up for 5A and nine speakers signed up for 4A, but members of the public can sign up up until the item is called. Right. And given and that that's not often raise our hands too. <laughs> and given that's not an inordinate number of speakers, I would suggest that you keep to your three minutes. Yeah, and I, with whatever you do, otherwise, in other words, that's not a good reason to, to limit. You don't have a, an, an excessive volume of speakers to where you might need to limit it. Okay. Okay, I'll accept the amendment. Friendly amendment. All right. So we have a motion and a second to move 5A in front of 4A. We are not changing the amount of time. If we get to 5A and we have 40 people who want to talk, it's going to a minute, or at least I'm going to try to put do that at that time. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you call the roll? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Uh, yes. Councilmember Earing? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. May Motion I have here. a... May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on January 14th, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on January 20th, 2022. Thank you very much. Do we have any speakers signed up for 2A? Yes, you have six speakers signed up for 2A. Our first two speakers are Bill Sampson, followed by John Johannesson and Jeremy Walker. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Well, pretty well, thank you. Good. Uh, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone again of a portion of Municipal Code Section 17.02.030. I will not read all of it. It says, Malibu is a unique land and marine environment and residential community whose citizens have historically evidenced a commitment to sacrifice urban and suburban conveniences in order to protect that environment and lifestyle and to preserve unaltered natural resources and rural characteristics. The people of Malibu are a responsible custodian of the area's natural resources for present and future generations. That's the end of the quotation. Um, Thank you. Some of you, it's the end of the quotation. It's not the end of my remarks. <laughs> Thank you, if, if you don't mind. Um, so, nowhere does the word monetize appear in here. To my knowledge, it does not appear within the municipal code at all. Uh, in my opinion, some of you have become more interested in real estate and the fortunes that can be made, and in at least one instance have been made in that business, instead of what we've got here. What we've got here is very special. Uh, I have been informed by um, at least one person who should know, and I don't want to breach his confidence, who was a male, um, that there are about six hotels on the drawing board, including one you'll be considering tonight. Uh, I do not see how that is consistent with our vision statement, and I would urge all of you to closely uh, follow it. I believe that Bruce and Steve are dedicated to that. I'm not so sure about Karen. I'm not so, I'm pretty sure Paul is far less dedicated. Mikey, I, you strike me as being on the precipice. It's why we're here. It's why we moved here. Let's not forget that. As a matter of fact, all of you took an oath to uphold what I just read to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our Who do we have next? We have John Johannesson, followed by Jeremy Walker and Norm Haney. Hi, John. Are you available? Are you there, John? 
John, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. If he's away from his computer at the moment, we can try to circle back and go to Jeremy Walker next. Okay, Jeremy, are you available? Are you there? Yes, we are. Okay, I, I've got my mute button off now. Hi, Hi everyone. <clears throat> and thank Hi, you for the opportunity to speak tonight about the Malibu Performing Arts Center. Currently, there is no space available in Malibu to house or call home for the Malibu Performing Arts Center. Therefore, the city of Malibu, along with the Malibu Arts Commission and the citizens of Malibu need to be supportive and work together to accomplish this adventure. The construction and development of the Malibu Performing Arts Center should be orchestrated by the Malibu Arts Commission because the Malibu Arts Commission has been very well established here in Malibu and is highly recognized by the local citizens and city of Malibu. There are several ways to utilize the Malibu Performing Arts Center as Malibu has so many artists in so many ways. For example, there are many concerts, including the Guitar Festival that could be held in Malibu, but are passed off to other cities because of the space that's simply not available here in Malibu. The Los Angeles Performing Arts Conservancy that teaches acting classes and produces several plays each year needs a place to call home. The Malibu Playhouse is not available anymore. The Malibu Film Society shows screenings of upcoming new released movies and documentaries, including the Q&A with the producers, actors, and developers of the new released films. The theater must be able to comfortably seat up to 500 seats. This area will be a multi-purpose room to include sit down dinner events, movie screenings, plays, concerts, city events, etc. There is currently no place in Malibu to even show movies. Other functions, including the Malibu Arts Festival that is hosted by the Malibu Chamber of Commerce, currently has no place to show an art exhibit or to even park all the cars for the event. There are several talented local Malibu artists that also need a place to display their artwork as well. Malibu needs its own performing arts center to feature the local artists, the local talent, and encourage young adults to reach their dreams in the art community, including singing, producing music, movies, and artwork of all, of all kinds. I encourage everyone here today to leap forward into our new year, establishing and assisting with the Malibu Performing Arts Center. The city of Malibu owns several acres of land throughout Malibu, and we need the city to donate at least 15 acres of land for the Performing Arts Center and the adjacent parking lots. For example, the parcels of land located on Pacific Coast Highway between Heathercliff and Portshead Road has been recently discussed, as well as land in the Civic Center area. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank and you. Next, we have Jeremy Walker, followed by Norman Haney and Scott Dietrich. Hello, Mr. Walker. Are you available? Hi there. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Fantastic. Um, I just want to say that I'm submitting a, I submitted a letter uh, uh, through um, Kelsey, and you can all read that. I hope you've read it. Uh, but I wanted to say that it's submitted in the spirit of something I saw the president of the United States. Uh, he met with mayors recently from all around the country. And he said, there's all this money right now. Use it. The time to use it is now. And then Hans Lutz reported on KVU that the city of Malibu is actually awash in money right now. And I can't, well, I mean, these are relative things. If you can bus to move to uh, try to buy off Santa Monica Unified School District for, for $40 million, it occurred to me that maybe you could bus to move and for $40,000 explore the idea of uh, the city of Malibu acquiring a herd of goats for uh, land use to clear, you know, land literally around property and around neighborhoods. Um, uh, I would love, I, vol I, I would love to be a part of planning for that move to be busted. Uh, I hope you will refer it to staff and I'd love to meet with staff about that and figure out how to move forward. Thank you guys so much. Keep rocking it. Thank you, Jeremy. 
And next we have Norman Haney, followed by Scott Dietrich and Ryan. Good evening, Norm. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, good evening, Planning Commissioners. Um, there was a bit of an error made here. I uh, asked my associate to sign me up for the Planning Commission and not the City Council. Uh, when I get in front of the City uh, Planning Commission, I'm going to ask them to uh, be willing to hear a, um, a discussion from Reg Brown, who's one of the foremost uh, ocean engineers and structural engineers in the city. And he has offered to make a presentation on sea level rise, what the probabilities are uh, of, of um, sea level rising and uh, over time. And it's not, uh, it's not fettered with uh, politics or environmental uh, issues or objectives. So I will be calling each of you uh, when that, uh, assuming that the Planning Commission is interested in hearing a presentation from Reg Brown, I will be calling you so that you can uh, listen in and perhaps request the same type of presentation. That's it. Have a good night. Thank you, Norm. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Ryan and Lynn Norton. Scott, are you available? And thank you. Yeah, hi, Paul um, and Council. Uh, it, it's come to my attention recently that our staff is under really a lot of stress right now. And I, I think it's a lot resulting from uh, social media. People we all know will say stuff on social media that they'd never say in person. They cast insults and call people names and all kinds of crazy stuff. And that really doesn't help when they're trying to make a point to our staff who, you know, works hard and is trying to navigate the whole work at home thing, which works sometimes to their benefit and sometimes not. But I just like to urge people to, well, feel free to contact staff. They'll respond very quickly. Um, most of the time, they have a lot of experience, but just hold back on trashing people. That uh, That's just uncalled for. And it doesn't help in our little city to do that. Um, whether, you know, sure, disagree with Paul, the other council members, whatever, that's fine. But hold off on, on the name calling and, you know, the conspiracy theories. And I think we'll all be better off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Lynn Norton. Are you ready, Mr. Ambery? <clears throat> Uh, good evening, Council. I wanted to um, discuss the uh, rent that the city gets from the lumberyard projects because in the mid 2000s, um, I and many members of the city were asked, we donated cash money to the city to make up for the lost grant funds that the city did, turned out or didn't finish applying for for the clean water project, which is Legacy Park. And we lost several million dollars. I don't know how much we raised from community donations, um, but the Legacy Park operations are supposed to be supported by the minimum base rent from the lumberyard lease. And that lease uh, has been amended a few times. And I think the caps have been reduced. Uh, the amount of increases is, is half what it was um, at the last, uh, the third modification. And uh, we just heard from uh, another speaker that explained, you know, the vision for having some type of a Malibu Performing Arts Center or a center of some kind. Maybe it would be a multi-purpose. But um, we also 
our funding, the certificates of participation for the purchase of the building uh, City Hall, which was a performing arts theater. And a few rows of seats were ripped out of the back to put in a closed hallway to the public works department. But the theater component was promised to the community to be, become available and to continue these types of arts in the Malibu area. We don't need to build a whole new theater. Uh, that'll take five years, I'm sure. Why don't we just work on a performing arts budget where the city doesn't turn into a high-priced landlord for every producer who wants to put on a show? Now, you've got uh, an obligation to um, use the funds that come in from the Legacy Park for clean water projects and so forth. But you have also income coming in from many other sources. And it's my understanding that you reduced the rent for some you know, connected tenants over the last two or three years uh, in the other city property holdings. And I'd like you to audit that. I think the citizens of Malibu should know You've got a fabulously qualified, or you used to have a fabulously qualified treasurer because I don't know who is our treasurer now, because I don't think you can do both. You can't report to yourself. That, um, so, but the amount of money deferred or rent reduction uh, or modification, the public is subsidizing these entities that entered into leases with the city. We ought to know what's going on. And, and maybe this is all unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Embry. And our next speaker is Lynn Norton. Hi, Lynn, are you available? Hi. Hello. Hi, I just had a uh, point about tonight's meeting, which is that I don't know if I haven't followed if any of you have expressed opinions about item five on the agenda, but if it's just a no brainer to everybody that that you should release that information to the public, I just thought it could really cut the meeting shorter if somehow you could dispense with that. I don't know if it's something that really needs a lot of debate, but to avoid a whole big drama, if and just in case it's just a no brainer for all five of you. Lynn, yeah, that's an agendized item. This is the time for things that are not agendized. I know, but my comment is more about the schedule of the meeting tonight itself. You know, that's all. That's all I have to say. Thank you. We moved it to in front of 4A. Okay, thank you. All right. And Mayor, that was our last speaker sign up and I don't see any raised hands in the meeting. So that concludes public comment. Terrific. Uh, do we have any commission or committee updates? Yes, we have Lance Simmons here to give an update. Hi, Lance. What will you be reporting on to us today? Lance, you should have the pop up asking you to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Lance. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to give a brief uh, update to the council that uh, as chair of the Public Works Commission, uh, I chaired a special uh, meeting on January 20th with the uh, Public Works and the Public Safety Commission uh, to talk about um, the Westward Beach Improvements Project. And uh, I wanna, first of all, thank all those who expressed opinions. We had uh, uh, quite a good uh, Zoom turnout and um, a lot of good ideas were expressed. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, uh, took a unanimous vote to uh, revisit um, several of the working pieces uh, of the improvement project. And um, I think we're making really good progress on this. We're taking into consideration uh, a lot of ideas which came from the community. And uh, I want to especially uh, thank Andrew Ferguson for uh, involving us uh, in a discussion of the project. And um, I just want to let uh, the council know that uh, we are going to expedite this uh, to every degree possible. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with the Public Safety Commission and the Public Works Commission to uh, present a modified uh, project 
as soon as possible. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Lance. Do we have any other reports, Kelsey? No, we don't have any other commissioner reports. Do we have a city manager update? Yes, we do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. A few things to report on today. Um, regarding the situation, what's happening with the current uh, COVID surge, um, as of uh, Friday, I did hear a report from the county health. They've seen a 3,000% increase in new cases since the beginning of December. Um, and correspondingly, last week, uh, they recorded in the county 102 deaths. That was the highest number uh, that they have attributed to COVID since uh, March of 2021 and during the pandemic. Uh, they reported that, uh, estimated that 90% of the new cases after December 24th of last year were likely due to the Omicron variant. Um, they are seeing some concern in terms of nearing capacity at local hospitals um, and admissions to hospitals in the County of Los Angeles are up about 1000% since December 1st. Um, still seeing levels of very high transmission. Uh, I think it's pretty well known that the, uh, the variant uh, appears to be uh, highly transmissible, even higher uh, than some of the, uh, um, the previous variants that had been circulating uh, in the community. Um, and while many persons are vaccinated, uh, and uh, especially those who are vaccinated, or many of them are having uh, mild symptoms, uh, the public is still urged to uh, consider this as not a mild illness. It still has the potential uh, for very severe uh, health uh, impacts, especially to those persons uh, who are unvaccinated. Uh, moving on to the uh, through the COVID theme, um, City Hall remains closed to the public. Um, we had an announced that closure through Friday, uh, January 28th. I will be, uh, we will be reevaluating that uh, this week and uh, determining whether or not to extend that closure. Uh, we'll be making that decision and announcing that prior to Friday. Uh, because of the uh, surge, uh, the current surge to the Omicron, uh, the homeless count that was originally scheduled to take place in this month has been delayed. Uh, that has now been rescheduled to February 23rd, uh, beginning at 6.30 a.m. Also uh, wanted to report that uh, this Saturday, uh, we will again be hosting a uh, COVID testing site here at Malibu City Hall. Um, we had the, that, that will be this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, here in the parking lot. Uh, this is a repeat of uh, the event that was held last Saturday, also at City Hall. I wanna thank uh, Malibu Medical uh, the Malibu CERT team and our city public safety staff for their coordination and for running this event. Um, also wanted to report regarding uh, the Malibu High School and um, the EIR. Um, the city had submitted uh, comments uh, to the school district re regarding uh, their comments back to the city's comments on the EIR. Uh, and uh, we had asked for some uh, further consideration and the school district was gracious enough to grant that. Uh, they have rescheduled the matter of considering the certification of the EIR for the high school uh, to this Wednesday, January 26th. Uh, the city will be submitting uh, a letter um, noting that uh, the school district has addressed the city's concerns and we will have city planning staff in attendance at that meeting. I wanted to report that I attended uh, meetings uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, for the um, Malibu and Las Virginis uh, Council of Governments, and also last week for the uh, uh, PCH task force. A lot of topics were covered there. Um, just also want to report that we did not have any significant issues either from the tsunami, although we did have some impacts from the uh, windstorm over the weekend. 
Uh, we did have some local impacts from the winds and a couple some trees down and some wires down, uh, but fortunately we didn't have any major incidents to report. That's the extent of my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Is uh, Jim Braden available? Do you, is he in the room, Kelsey? He is. We'll get him unmuted for you right now. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. The uh, I'm sorry if some of you didn't know. I'm uh, off work with a hip injury, and I'm going to have some month. I'll probably be out for a couple months. So I believe Chuck uh, assigned uh, Lieutenant Chad Waters to take over while I'm off. So if he's not on there, I apologize and I'll check into it and make sure someone's on there. So I've been off since December 23rd. And uh, so I don't have a lot to report because I haven't been being in the loop of being updated on everything. But I will be back after my uh, hip injury, so. Thank you. I, I'm uh, so sorry to hear that you've been, you have an injury and uh, I, I thought we had offended you. So I'm glad that wasn't the case and I wish you a speedy recovery. Oh, thank you very much. So, and I wish everybody a uh, happy new year and um, I hope, uh, we can have a productive new year as far as things going on in Malibu. Thank you. I just saw Bruce's hand. Did you have a question, Bruce? No, I just wanted to extend my best wishes to Jim. I had just learned about his um, needing to have surgery a couple of days ago and uh, we're all pulling for you, Jim. Oh, I, I thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, um, uh, like I said, I'll be back probably in mid-April, but I will check into it and make sure someone's coming in, in, in speaking on behalf of the Sheriff's Department uh, um, as far as Malibu issues and uh, ways we can rectify things. We apologize for interrupting your recovery. Oh, you're not. So Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have any City Council subcommittee reports? Karen, I see your hand. Um, two things, Paul. I will give my report quickly, but I may need some uh, offline tech help. I have a problem with my computer charger and I'm realizing it's not the outlet, it's the part that goes into my computer. And right now I'm at 9% and I don't have another charger. So I don't know if anybody can help me offline with this. Uh, but I can give my report quickly, and then maybe we can work on this other issue. Um, I will quickly acknowledge the public speakers. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We need a performing arts center. I don't know when uh, we'll be able to put that into the budget, but I'd love to see it happen. Um, Jeremy Walker, uh, regarding the goats, I've asked about that in the past myself. Um, the city can only use goats on city property, and there's not a whole lot of what I would call goatable property owned by the city. Um, so that might be something that neighborhoods would want to get together and do. Um, and maybe there is more goatable property owned by the city than I'm thinking there is. Um, Norm Haney, great. I'd love to hear a uh, presentation on sea level rise, but we'll let the Planning Commission uh, deal with that first, if that's the order you'd like to have it happen in. Scott Dietrich, I agree. Social media is an unusual uh, entity, isn't it? Um, Lance, thank you for your work on the Public Works Commission. And I, I know that's a a lot to consider with that project with Westward Beach Road. And I appreciate your commitment to um, bring back a modified project as soon as possible. Uh, that's it for me. And I'm uh, I'm in battery. Oh, I'm up to 11%. Hey, maybe I'm improving here. Are you okay. on a laptop or a PC? Laptop. 
So the yeah. city laptop. So I have that cord here if you want to send somebody over. <laughs> okay, thank you. Karen, if you're having difficulties, it might be best if you left the meeting for a few moments and called Alex. He's ready to help you. And then um, when you come back during the rest of the council comments, we'll just note it. Okay, thank you. Could I make okay, one other I'll suggestion for, for what it's worth, Karen? When, this happened to me once before where I, I just wasn't able to use my computer. I got on with my phone until I got my computer issue fixed. So you might want to consider that. Okay, thank you. I was thinking that would be my backup. Um, but Alex, if you're ready, I'll log off for a minute so we can talk. Okay. Okay. John, uh, do we wait or do we continue? You're entitled to wait, but you still have a quorum, so you can proceed if you, that's the council's pleasure. Okay. Well, uh, I see Steve's hand. Let's, uh, let's continue to grind through this. You're, you're muted, Steve. I would just suggest if Karen went from 9% to 12%, her charge may in fact be working, but that, Alex is smarter than me. That's his, that's above my pay grade. Uh, okay, it's gonna be a long meeting, meeting, so I'll try and keep it short. Uh, we had an administrative and finance committee meeting a week ago. Uh, you're gonna hear about the budget tonight. I think there's gonna be some joy in the fact that we're, we've recovered very well after the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, Lottie Charon uh, also called me and asked us to, to try and consider a performing arts center and, and you know, develop the arts society. Uh, I, I'd like to see how we can do that. And you know, there may be a way to do something in city hall and turn that performing arts center that we got there and, and make that in the short run, something they can use. Uh, but hopefully we can get some people to take a look at that. And then the last item I have at, City Council meeting a week or two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, Councilmember Silverstein made a recommendation and said, you know, to sort of help some of these people who are trying to rebuild, is, is there any advantage to, for us to take and prioritize the houses, rebuilding the firehouse, the burnouts for those residents who live in Malibu uh, and really focus on that. And at the same time, maybe put some of these commercial projects on hold for six months until we sort of get a, a good handle on that. Uh, and I brought that up again at the Administrative and Finance Committee meeting. And I'm just wondering, you know, and, and Steve, if you could have somebody take, I don't want a huge study on this. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, you know? And, and maybe if you could just sort of ask uh, Richard and Yolanda whether they think there is some benefit in doing something like that. If the answer comes back yes, then maybe we can get the city council to take a look at trying to get a presentation to see if that's really something that will help us move some of these fire re rebuilds, you know, through a little bit faster. Uh, but I don't want to do it unless we know, uh, unless the people who are doing this have a feeling that actually is going to provide a benefit. So if you could do that, don't, you know, I don't want a long staff report, just some ideas. If it looks like it's good, we can bring it back and do some more work on it. So if you could do that, I appreciate that, my friend. Happy to do so. Okay. Thank you, Steve. That's it, Paul. Okay. Uh... Mikey or, or Bruce? I, got my, I realize it's kind of tone on tone tonight, so it's a little hard to see. Um, let's, here. Oh, yeah, I see your hand. There, there I, I can put my hand over my hand. Yeah. Um, um, okay, yeah, this this will be pretty quick. Thanks to all of the speakers, every one of them. Um, the ones I want to comment on, John Johansson. Yes, this uh, obviously the uh, Arts Commission has been discussing this. I had a talk with Barry, my commissioner today. I think what caught me off guard, and I actually tried to look for the, um, the agenda item from the past, but I didn't have a lot of time today and I didn't find it, but is that discussion of an arts center is not on the work list for the Arts Commission. And I would have sworn it was. Now, of course, it looks like I'm wrong, but. Um, I would uh, like to see if we can get consensus here to bring back an item. I assume this is the way it has to happen to add that to an item on their work list. I've personally worked on it for years. It's a really difficult project. It's frustrating. It's hard. It's not going to be easy. So I think that's absolutely something that that commission should be working on. So I don't know. 
out of the four Maria of us. Grisanti, yeah. I might be able to help. The council is scheduled to discuss the mid-year commission activity reports and work assignments is item 6B. Oh, I didn't know we got to go over the work assignments. So thank you. I will shelve that and move on. Um, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Jeremy Walker, I gather you live in Malibu West where I live. Um, I would love to meet you and discuss goats. I am fascinated by the idea. I've watched videos on it. We've we've struggled in this area. A lot of people are interested. I'd, I'd like to get a better understanding. It sounds like you know a lot more about goats than I do. I just know about the cute little ones on TikTok that dance around and all that. So I'd, I'd like to learn more. Um, Norm Haney, yes, would love to hear that presentation. Scott Dietrich, I'm starting to just echo Karen here. Yes, social media <sighs> nationwide has been really, really tough on a lot of different people and institutions. And um, I agree. I wish we could all somehow just be nicer and get along better. Um, Ryan, I will say um, it's a public document on all the finances for um, the lumber yard. They have had significant financial issues. I'm not defending it. I'm just pointing it out. If you go by there, you notice there's always way too many empty spaces which is related. It is a difficult space to uh, make successful and make money. But uh, so your point's good, but it is, there is public document on all the funding. Probably, you know, be a chore to find it, but it is findable. All right, could try and help. Um, Lance, thank you so much for uh, running that meeting. Um, and thank you, Andrew, Andrew Ferguson, for all you've done too. You've been super helpful and your letter today was was excellent as well. Big issue, as we know, and uh, thank you, uh, thanks the those both those commissions for moving forward on this quickly, and and it seems like it went really, really well. Um, and Lieutenant Braden, yes, indeed, uh, we have talked, but heal, my friend, heal. Um, for myself, I attended a LACO meeting in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we are really in the heart of making progress on this on this whole LACO thing with the school separation. And our team has put together some amazing materials, which will all be out soon. Um, we've had fire brigade training here in the neighborhood, which um, I know some point doom and a bunch of people from Big Rock showed up and uh, Matt Haynes uh, from uh, Grau Canyon ran it. So uh, that was excellent. Um, the mayor was there, Paul. Um, it was a good event. We had a PCH task force meeting. It was all right. <laughs> it was good. Um, um, all the higher up elected officials that are part of it were there, which was great. Um, I it's mostly feels sometimes like an accountability meeting with Caltrans and their projects. And there's nothing wrong with that. It gives us a chance to ask questions. Um, and some people, members of the public were there, which I was glad. I was hoping a couple more would be there, to be honest, particularly people that email us fairly often on issues. Because I really think the public voice in that meeting is very helpful. Um, but yes, as Rob has gone over, um, a lot of products on PCH happening now. And it's still dangerous and still scary. Um, and I believe that is my comments for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce? Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, nobody mentioned tonight, and it, it was reported to me, there was an armed robbery on Sunday morning in the Civic Center, in the, in the Civic Center area, actually in the uh, Whole Foods parking lot, is my understanding. That's very disconcerting. So um, we need to understand more about that and work on those kinds of things not happening. I mean, when I moved into Malibu, there was next to no violent crime, if any. And uh, that's about as violent as it gets when someone gets um, robbed at gunpoint. Um, and, and as I say, Steve continues to, Steve McClary can, continues to hold down the fort for us while we complete the effort to appoint a permanent city manager. Uh, even, I understand, working while ill over the past couple of weeks. So Steve, thank you for that. Um, and by the same token, John Cotty's been doing a great job of keeping the city attorney's seat warm. You know, he's also interim while we make a final decision in that regard. Maybe John, 
we don't know. Um, but thanks, John, for the hard work you put in as well. Um, I also attended the PCH task force meeting. And interestingly, we had a, there were, there were some presentations that by assembly member Bloom, Senator Stern, Senator Allen, that's not typical at the, uh, that meeting. Um, but what was mentioned by one or more of them was that, and this, this um, dovetails with Jeremy Walker's comments, there are, is unprecedented state and federal money floating around right now for um, infrastructure and other um, needs. And I recall during the election, Lance Simmons had some kind of a plan for um, beautification and modernization of PCH in Malibu. And I, and I have to say, I remember saying during a debate that that was pie in the sky because it would cost millions of dollars, probably maybe tens of millions of dollars. Uh, well, you know, mana may be falling from heaven and uh, this might be the time to start looking into that pie. So if Lance wants to dust off his, um, his work that he had done, um, I'd be interested in talking to him and maybe we could even have him work with the city to pursue some kind of a project where we can tap into some of that money and beautify and uh, modernize the P PCH. Um, other thing, I've been on calls with California Strategy. Um, I don't really have much to report with respect to that. Uh, I've been watching recordings of planning commission meetings and homelessness task force meetings, working on the city manager recruitment effort. Um, had discussions with some people about the ADU ordinance. Um, on the Woolsey fire rebuilds, what Steve raised, Steve, Steve didn't completely accurately describe what I had suggested. Um, I, no part of what I suggested was putting anything on hold for six months, um, but I do believe we should be looking into finding a way to have um, primary residence rebuilds for Woolsey, from Woolsey fire jump the line. So when it's time for an inspection or time for a permit approval, they go to the, they get to the front of the line, even if they're fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth in line at the moment. Um, and what got me thinking about that was watching uh, planning commission meetings where um, it's not unusual for a Woolsey Fire primary residence rebuild to even get bumped from being heard that night because there's not time to do it after other things are, are heard. And to me, that's just not the way it ought to work. If anything's gonna get bumped, it ought to be something that's not as urgent. And I know everybody's project is urgent to everybody, but um, the Woolsey fire rebuilds are, are, are different and special. Um, the other thing I'll say, I just want to talk briefly, well, I'm gonna to respond to the comments. Bill Sampson, and, and this was done in the past also, the, the question of the, the vision statement and the mission statement. I, I was gonna talk about this later during the, um, the, the, country, the, the um, hotel proposal, but I think it's more appropriate now you know, many people have reached out to me over the past few months, and I see it on social media as well, stressing the importance of the mission statement and the vision statement. And I've, um, I've done the same during a lot of the appeals, especially appeals from commercial development. Uh, and I did the same before I was even on council. As a member of public, I would, I would speak about that. You know, the, the staff often tells us, both publicly and when we ask questions of them in advance of hearings, that many provisions of the LCP, the Local Coastal Program and the MMC, the, the Malibu Municipal Code, um, are open to interpretation. There's, no there's not a clear result in many circumstances. Sometimes there is, but many times there isn't. And when that happens, it's up to the city council to decide how to interpret our law. Um, I agree with that. What the staff doesn't say, and I, and I don't mean this intentionally, but what they don't say is that the mission statement and the vision statement are a part of our law. They're a part of our local coastal program and they're a part of the municipal code. And because of that, they inform the interpretation of our other laws when it comes to matters that are affected by the vision statement and the mission statement or which implicate the vision statement and the mission statement. Um, and that's not just rhetoric. Um, so, you know, just real quick as a technical matter, I've wanted to explain this in the past, but the Coastal Act defines the local coastal program as including a local government's quote zoning ordinances. That's section 30108.6 of the Coastal Act. Malibu's local coastal program defines the term zoning ordinance. It defines it as Title 17 of the Malibu Municipal Code. Well, Title 17 is where the mission, mission statement and vision statement are codified. They are in section 17.02.030. So they're, they're a part of our municipal code by virtue of the Coastal Act. They're a part of our local coastal program. 
And they're not just um, something to aspire to, they're the law. And I don't think we talk about that enough when we have to interpret the code when it comes to LCP issues or municipal code issues with respect to building. There is a preference when things are vague to preserve our rural, um, all the characteristics, everything that's in those two statements. So I, I think that's a great point that Bill made again. Um, real quick, the, the performing arts center, as well as perhaps a fine arts center. Um, I, I agree. I've, I've been reached, people have reached out to me about that. Peter Jones, Barry Haldeman, as well as hearing tonight from John. Um, I, I think the civic center property that the city owns would be ideal if we could find a way to otherwise fund a building there. Obviously we need to get input from the public, but I, I think that would be an ideal use of that large parcel we have. I also um, have thought that perhaps there's a way to utilize library funds. We have 10 plus million dollars of funds for a library, which might be able to be melded together somehow in some grand program that would provide both arts as well as tech, traditional library service. So, you know, it's, I think it's something that definitely deserves a lot of attention and thought because that's that would be a great addition to our city. Um, Jeremy's point about the $40 million for the um, school separation. So, why, you know, obviously we're flushing money. That, that, I think that's a result of a misunderstanding. We don't have $40 million to throw at, at Santa Monica for school separation. That's money that is coming from the state or the county um, towards the schools. And it's just money that our school district wouldn't get, but their school district would get if we could negotiate a separation. So it's not like we're taking $40 million out of Malibu's budget and throwing that at Santa Monica. If anyone thinks that, that's a misunderstanding. It's an understandable misunderstanding, but it's an, a misunderstanding. Um, Scott Dittrich, I, I agree. You know, I've been accused of um, of being a little harsh on social media, maybe perhaps to say it lightly. But you know, I, I I don't talk about staff members that they're not they're not they're not public figures. They're not even quasi public figures. It's it's one thing to for people to comment about council members or even the city manager. It's another thing to talk about the subordinate staff and. I would, I would like to discourage people from doing that as well. I, I don't do that. And I haven't seen that from any other council member. And so I, it's, it's coming from people in the public. We don't have any control over that, but I try to discourage that as well. I, and I think that's a point well taken, Scott. Um, lastly, the Norton, haven't heard from you in a while, so good to hear your voice. Back to you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, once again, we thank the speakers. Uh, John Johannesson raised a good point, And I think that it touches on a more important point to me is we have this, we have the land and people want to know what we're thinking about doing with it. And we really need to have a set of hearings to come up with a menu of things that the city of Malibu wants. And once we come up with things that appeal to the, to the public, we may be able to find that we may be able to find funds from members of the public to have what they want done happen quicker. So that's something, but we have to have public outreach to get to that point. And I really think I'd like to see us schedule that sometime in, uh, in this year, I mean, in this budget year. But if we don't, I hope we'll get to it at the start of the next budget year. Uh, the, uh, I like the idea of GOATS. I don't want to, and uh, I'm interested to hear anybody talk about sea level rise. Uh, Ryan, uh, the rents from the lumber yard and the super and uh, the other stores, uh, if if you hadn't noticed, as Woolsey was very hard on retail, and the uh, pandemic and the huge move to uh, to shopping online has been even worse for retail. And if you look at retail rents in Los Angeles as a whole over the last three years, not even just in Malibu, they have cratered. So you have places in uh, Santa Monica, Melrose, that used to be getting over $20 a foot, and they're getting about $5 a foot now. And that's, that's part of uh, us trying to, the city of Malibu trying to keep our uh, property properties operating. So we didn't make any of those decisions. Those decisions were all made more than a couple of years ago, but still 
that that uh, is the only practical way to to make those centers continue to function. And uh, the uh, and I've been on an awful lot of uh, webinars about everything in the world, but I won't bore anybody with it. And I'd love to get to the next uh, to the. I'd love to get to the uh, consent calendar. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And Karen, we're glad to see you back on top on on board. And I hope that everything is going well with your computer. Have any items been pulled from the consent calendar? Yes, items 3B6 and 3B7 have been pulled by the public. 3B6 and 3B7? Correct. By the public. Do any members of the council want to pull something from the consent calendar? I see Bruce, you have your hand up. Well, since nobody pulled anything, I'll just make a motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of 3B6 and 3B7. I'll second. second. We, have, we only had three seconds. We could have gotten four. I'll, uh, Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Yarine? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So we now go to 3B6. Yes. And if you're ready for the public speaker, we have Ryan signed up. Ryan, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. The um, item here is the adjustment and um, acknowledgement and the, I guess the final funding swap for the money to complete the uh, bike lanes widening and the beautification project in front of the city's treatment plant in Webster School along uh, about three quarters of a mile of uh, Civic Center Way, which is where my property is. So uh, I wanted to historically remind the council because most of you weren't around when this uh, was happening uh, the Civic Center Way Task Force concluded with eight top recommendations, one of which was a substitute in case one of the others did not occur. But that that uh, road widening has now occurred on the road with this project, so we're down to seven. And of them, only four have been implemented. And the no-brainer one that didn't require much of anything, and you, you have other gas tax money, you could do it at any time, but it was supposed to have been part of this project, and that was to uh, item number six on the, the page two of the report from whenever it was. Um, I give you the date, but the, the item says radar speed signs on Civic Center Way between Malibu Canyon Road and Webb Way. And specifically, you know, we knew where it was supposed to go is at the bottom of the ditch where the speeds are the highest and there's a tangent traffic to Vista Pacifica Street where um, three condominium and townhome projects uh, adjacent to the school intersect the city's street. So I wanted to remind you to go ahead and get one for each side of the road and put it there. And let's just get on with it. Whether you can use this money or, or why it didn't, or did you run out of money? I don't know. What, let's hear the report. Um, but the, that's a much overdue and necessary component. Now we've got these signs on Malibu Road, which is 25 mile an hour road um, with, very, with no cross traffic. And yet the high traffic on Civic Center Way um, is, is not getting this information. And it can be used as um, for the new speed survey, which is item number four, is to reduce the speed limit uh, from 40 to 35 miles per hour. So thank you for taking uh, a chance to hear this when this item is up on your agenda and I have a chance to speak to it and your staff can tell you um, how much the interactive radar signs are and when they, or if they're already ordered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. 
Are there any other speakers? That was our only public speaker and I don't see any raised hands. So that concludes public comment. Uh, Rob, a quick question to you. Uh, were there supposed to be interactive speed signs for this project? No, that wasn't included in the scope of work. But if council wants that to be included, we can add, we, we can include that as a new capital improvement project later. I think we own two of them right now. Is that correct? <clears throat> um, we own quite a few. There's there's some in Point Doom, and there's a couple on on Bush Drive. Uh, we, we've also have permits to put some on PCH um, to put some on there. So uh, we, have a, we have a few. Okay. Uh, I'm going to recognize Bruce. I move to approve item uh, three to six. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> well, one I question though, Rob, was, was uh, that one of the items that was recommended for that area? Or what do you mean? The speed signs, the, were they recommended in years past that that be something that's done? I, I, I'd have to go back and look to see what was done um, and to see if that was something that was that was recommended back then. But I, I can I can double check. All right. Maybe we can revisit this issue when we hit the work plan. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Kelsey, will you call the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Do we have any? Uh, 3B7 was pulled as well. Do we have a speaker for that? Yes, we have two speakers signed up. They are Craig Hill and Scott Dietrich. We'll hear from Craig first. Hello, Craig. Are you available? Yeah, good evening, council members and staff and everyone. Um, the staff report asks you to execute the agreements with Caltrans, but a few things about the synchronization project seem uncertain. The report doesn't even list the traffic lights involved. It's hard to say exactly what the respective obligations of the city and Caltrans might be and what the actual costs would be, et cetera. And I had a nice chat with Rob Debo this afternoon, and he had good answers for some of my questions, but I'm still scratching my head a bit. The report says the project for the stretch of eight miles between Topanga and John Tyler Drive was identified in the 2015 PCH safety study. Now, I'm not sure what identified means exactly in that context, but regardless, since 2015, there have been two more manually triggered lights that didn't exist then at La Costa and at Malibu Beach Inn. There are also manual lights at Nobu and the pier, which have been around long. Now, right now, a valet can push the button by Nobu and get traffic to stop right away. It seems there's a fundamental conflict between, on one hand, synchronizing all the lights to produce an even flow of traffic, and on the other hand, allowing some lights to be on demand at the push of a button. So what will have to happen is that the manual lights, once triggered, will wait to change until they're within the timing of the rest of the cycle, to maintain the overall flow. And depending on when the button is pushed in relation to that cycle, sometimes the light may change right away, but sometimes a valet or an impatient tourist will be waiting several minutes for it to change. The valets will qu quickly learn not to wait for the light. They don't get tips for waiting around. and Instead, they'll run across the highway. Now, Rob suggests that the traffic computer algorithm is smart enough to accommodate both the overall flow and the individual on-demand lights, but I don't understand how that could be physically possible without sometimes incurring those long wait times for pedestrians. Meanwhile, um, I was recently looking for some light reading, no pun there, and came across the consent agreement between the Malibu Beach and the Coastal Commission. In it, item 4.3 expressly requires that the signal there shall be linked and coordinated by fiber optic cable and smart controller to the existing crosswalk signals to the east and west to improve traffic flow and safety. So synchronized with the lights at Nobu and the pier. But the public has been told that light is independent on demand. I shared that language with Rob and he wasn't sure offhand whether those three lights are currently synced with each other. Maybe he knows now. Regardless, that half mile stretch is at the heart of PCH traffic, whether it's busy beach days or during rush hours. So if any of those three lights aren't part of the greater eight mile synchronization, there's little point in trying to synchronize anything. 
Now, I hear this will be coming to the Planning Commission. We're not sure when. Uh, I hope it comes soon enough in the process that the community can have a meaningful say in how these kinds of issues are worked out. And there are a few others, but I don't have time. Um, and that the public will be well notified so they'll know when to show up and weigh in. Thank you. Good evening. Hey, thank you, Craig. Our next speaker Scott? is Scott Dietrich. You there, Scott? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Craig really covered it in much more detail than I would. But yeah, I, in general, of course, it's a great project. And we on the Public Works Commission have been working on it. And uh, but there are some questions that Craig raised in terms, are there going to be certain lights that are going to be manually activated? And and I think before it goes to planning, we and you guys vote on it eventually. We need to know that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any other speakers? Yes, I see we have a raised hand from Joe Drummond, so we'll hear from her next. Hi, Joe. Are you available? Hi, how are you? I just had a question. I know that um one of the lights, the more recent lights put in is the one at Big Rock. And if you stop at the bottom of the light depending on the time of day it's either 30 seconds or 75 seconds before it changes so i'm just wondering if that's one of the things that craig is talking about and if if that'll be affected by these synchronization projects that's all thank you thank you i see steve has his hand raised and i don't see any other raised hands from the public i'm so sorry include public comment thank you kelsey steve yeah, and I don't have an answer to Joe's question, but uh, this, this is to Rob. Rob, I, this, I think this is a good project, all right? And I think it's something that the community will be will embrace once they learn how it's going to work and what it's all about. So I do encourage you to, you know, bring it to the Planning Commission, uh, publicize it so the community's got a chance to get out and speak about it. If they've got some concerns, they can express them. Uh, I just don't want to have a repeat of Westward Beach where you guys do all this work in the beginning and then get to the end and somebody raises their hand and says, so if, just make sure you get it to the Planning Commission, let them get the public involved, and I think we've got ourselves a good project. Thanks, Paul. I want to take a second and respond to Craig. Uh, there is an on-demand light on La Costa Beach for the uh, beach club there, and the way they've worked that, somehow it is connected to the lights on either side, because if you get there and push the button, the uh, signal is smart enough to wait for the, whatever platoon there is to go by. I haven't seen it stop a platoon yet. So hopefully that is a forerunner of what we're going to get. Bruce? Yeah, thanks. You know, I, I've never believed any of those on-demand lights work anywhere. I mean, I press them and Never in my life have I seen it work, but maybe I just don't understand what it's supposed to be doing. Um, I, I guess what I'm hearing is if the way it works is it doesn't give you a green light, but it informs the system that you're there so that when the next opportunity for a green light, there should be one. Otherwise, it should always be letting the traffic go. That makes sense to me, and that wouldn't affect synchronization. If what it does is it, it gives someone who's at the light an ability to cross at a time that otherwise wouldn't be there in a normal cycle, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'd like, I guess I'd like to understand which of those two it is, or maybe it's a third that I don't understand. Thank you, Bruce. Rob, do you want to try or may I? Um, well, first of all, I, I want to make sure that you're, um, that this, that this, this agreement tonight is with Caltrans um, it's a co-op agreement we have with Caltrans. This, this project is a large project within Caltrans right away, and it requires different phases and agreements with Caltrans. This agreement here is um, spelling out the city's responsibility during construction and Caltrans's responsibility of construction. And basically what it's saying is, Hey, the city, you guys manage the construction and you pay for everything and we'll be there for support. And and then it also kind of it, it kind of says says some of the requirements that we have to have in construction. Now, so, so I'm going to go back to some of the questions that go along with this. Um, 
all the signals, even the new ones that were put in um, after the 2015 uh, uh, PCA safety study will be part of this project. All, all signals will be interconnected and they'll be part of the whole signal synch synchronization um, project. It, it, all of the signals will be will have special sensors um, that will that will detect traffic in, in certain situations and adjust the timing and synchronization of the lights accordingly based on um, the current traffic demands. And, and so that's what's very um, new and innovative with this project to have the ability to kind of have the technology built into the traffic signals to be able to kind of on the fly adjust those um, traffic signals. So like what uh, Joe Drummond's mentioned, some, some times of the day, it's 30 seconds, other times it's longer. Well, yeah, um, the signal will be able to pick up the traffic and adjust that automatically. And so, so instead of only part of the, part of the day, it, it will actually identify those times when it's it can actually allow those those turns to, to occur. Um, let's see, did I answer did I answer it right, or or was Chris was there something else that was I missing, or was there something specific? Yeah, what, what I think Craig was asking, and and, oh. and I'm asking as well is, um, will will a valet at Nobu, for example, yeah, yeah. be able yeah. to get the light to be different? <clears throat> Otherwise, would have been based on the traffic because they want to get out of the parking lot. Yeah. So, so Craig and I did have a conversation about that. Yes. Uh, what will happen was uh, um, the signal timing programs will will be put in place to where um, if a, someone goes and hits the hits the um, the push button for pedestrian crossing, that will signal to the controller and timing and, and look at available gaps to go in. But it also has a timer to that will adjust to that and, and, and it, it will take in consideration all the synchronization that goes on and, and, and find out a good time to do that. One of the things that we were talking about, <clears throat> Craig and I, was there's a period of time where if, if someone's sitting there waiting, 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 and they get impatient and go, that's a problem. And, and so what we were, what I would, what I told, well, told Craig was that this system is very, very flexible. It it will automatically make those changes. But if we see those things happening, we can make adjustments with with the programming and synchronization to to accommodate those um, the the wait time when someone presses a button. And, you know, maybe it's it's a shortened wait time that people can kind of kind of go and then, but also look at the signal timing and the time of the day and all, there's a lot of factors that can go into that. It's very complicated and engineering. And I'm getting all excited about it. And, and uh, but um, I, yeah. Rob, I guess the, what I'm and I know this is probably getting beyond what we're approving tonight. But what I'm trying to say is like, so if you're doing if you're doing construction and you got a flag person hmm. and there's a major road that's traveling and then there's a there's a, a, a side street like a residential street. Obviously, the flag person doesn't bother to stop the traffic when no one is waiting to get out of the side street because that would be silly. But they also don't immediately stop the traffic just because someone shows up and wants to get out. They make an assessment as to how that's going to impact the overall traffic. Correct. Is this going to stop for every time somebody from Nobu or Beach Inn or wherever wants to get a green light so they can get out? Or is this going to be like the flag person that says, OK, if no one's there, we're going to let all the traffic keep going back and forth. And if someone's there, I'm going to use my computer program, my, my yeah. logarithm to, to determine algorithm, I'm sorry, to determine yeah. whether it's an appropriate time to let someone out or not. The second part, th okay. that one, th that's that's more like it. But um, what's what's triggering kind of um, the whole analysis and, and configuration is the wait time for someone at that intersection. And so if the wait time is long, we have to look at that and maybe have to change up and kind of adjust and, and configure some of that just to make sure we, we're not seeing people kind of jaywalk and do that, which is unsafe too. And so, you know, as like I mentioned, it, this has a lot of flexibility, um, but, you know, but I do uh, um, also want to respond back to uh, Commissioner or uh, council member hearing is that, yeah, we, I'm looking forward to kind of bringing this to the planning commission. We brought this 
countless amount of times through the Public Works and Public Safety Commission and gone through and, and gone to over kind of comments. But but yeah, the more people kind of come in and, and do this, it, it's better input. Uh, um, it, it's helped out with with me getting to know what things are kind of we need to kind of work on and whatnot and getting public input. It, it's it's a good process. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call the question. Do we have a motion to? Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve uh, item 3B7. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I believe that takes us to item 5A. Do we have any members of the public who've signed up to speak on this item? I, I was recused from the vote on doing this underlying investigation, so I'm going to recuse myself from this conversation as well. I'll drop off and I'll come back when you're all done. Okay. So do, how many members of the public do we have to speak? Let me get that updated number for you. You have 10 speakers for this item. Uh, will anybody vote with me to reduce it to two minutes a person? Looks like three minutes it is. Who do we have to speak? Who's first? John, did you need to make any comments before we jump into public speakers? Uh, Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, I'm happy to give you a staff report. The, the staff report, the, the written document was fairly detailed. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. We believe the document that you are discussing tonight is protected by the attorney-client privilege. Um, it is a policy consideration for the council as to whether or not it wants to waive that privilege, both as to the report and to any discussions in closed session that occurred was related to it. Um, again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, though, that there are risks in doing so. You did enter into a se separation agreement with Ms. Feldman that had a uh, non-disparagement and non-disclosure provision. Arguably, this uh, falls within the ambit of that, uh, that document. And I would caution you that once you waive the attorney-client privilege related to any document or any closed session uh, discussions, that, dis that uh, waiver is forever, at least as to these items that you're intending to or potentially releasing tonight. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions. I would just note that there are risks in doing so, but again, it's a policy consideration for you. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Okay, well, our first few speakers are Bill Sampson, Suzanne Gildeman, and Rosemary Ide. We'll hear from Bill first. Hi, Bill, are you available? I am, thank you. I may only take two minutes, but then that would be a first, wouldn't it? Um, I, I would respectfully disagree with John on uh, uh, this public record being a disparagement. I believe there's a saving clause. I believe it's 10.2 uh, in Ms. Feldman's uh, agreement. Uh, I would note that two of you, uh, Ms. Ferrer and Mr. Pearson, recently sent a letter concerning two people who had a pretty obvious conflict, in my opinion. Believe it or not, I happen to agree with the two of you, at least as to the tone of your remarks. Um, I, I couldn't tell if you were making on behalf of the city or if you were making them on your own behalf, because I, it showed up in a bunch of places. Uh, nevertheless, uh, your remarks concluded with um, basically transparent, transparency, excuse me, being a fundamental aspect of our democracy and how we needed to demonstrate that to our kids. And I could not agree more. I paid for this. It happens to be my opinion that Ms. Feldman held us up. She, it was my opinion, she failed in her job as city manager. When her feet were held in the fire, she ran. You can disagree with that. She got 300,000 bucks of our money, plus I don't know how much, and it cost us all a lot. And the basis appeared, at least to me, and I think to others, that Mr. Silverstein was somehow harassing her, including gender-based harassment, which uh, I believe in a previous uh, remarks, 
I would have characterized as sexual harassment. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the difference between that and gender harassment, but uh, that was one of the allegations. Uh, if they're true, I'll join you in pillorying Mr. Silverstein because he shouldn't have done it. I don't think they're true, but I do want to know. All of us want to know. Um, I hope that the five of you will unanimously say, okay, this is what we did. And if there is backup on why you did it, show us. We paid for it. It's our report. Technically, I suppose the attorney-client privilege applies to the council. Why it doesn't apply to us, I don't know. If it's 3-2, it's pretty silly because Mr. Cotty can correct me. The next council would decide 3-2 the other way and waive the privilege. I suggest you do it now and let's get this behind us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Suzanne Gilderman, followed by Rosemary Ide and Joe Drummond. Hi, Suzanne Gilderman. Are you available? I am. Um, unfortunately, conspiracy theories tend to grow and thrive in darkness and silence. I think if we're ever going to move past this regrettable chapter in Malibu's history, we need to know what the findings are in that report. We need to put this behind us and get on with the business of governing Malibu. And in order to do that, uh, we need to let the light in on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Who do we have next? Next, we have Rosemary Ide, followed by Joe Drummond and Georgia Goldfarb. Hi, Rosemary, are you available? Yes, I am. Okay, I will yield my time to play the video. Thank you. That's great. I, the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. That's great. I mean, we want transparency, no matter how people perceive it, I'm I'd all like for it. I'd like to address it. something that several of them said. Um, there's a need for transparency and accountability. I could not agree more. That's why I think this investigation is critical. We can't pretend that this letter uh, was not sent to the city on behalf of the city manager's attorney. Uh, we can't ignore the charges made in it. Um, and I agree with what Barry Haldeman said. Um, when this is investigated, um, we'd like to see the city get a clean bill of health. And I have spent no small amount of time thinking about how uh, we are going to attract a new city manager. Uh, if we've got this we need cloud to deal over with this uh, quickly and publicly and uh, get an independent investigation. My take on on what's gone on and, and how we should be responding to it is is pretty pretty closely aligned with Mikey. I too come from a business where if there is any kind of a, a uh, allegation like this, it, it gets dealt with very quickly or we're going to lose both the people. They're both both the people who are producing members of the community end up walking out the door. And I, I don't want to see that. And I, you know, I'm going to go slightly off, off pace here for a second. In the last part, one of the things that, that they were talking about, uh, Jefferson Wagner's uh, thing was talking about investigating was that someone was found doing something wrong and they were terminated. And um, to me, that is what you do when somebody is doing wrong, something wrong. You terminate them as quickly as possible, and you, you know, you move on with life and and try to restore uh, harmony to the to the firm. So, I, I think that the investigation needs to get done. It needs to get done right away. And it, it shouldn't take a lot of money because everything is all out there in public. What happened? Mike, let Mikey answer, please. Well, I guess then we know it. I know we know we're at risk, and we're going to need to have to deal with how we're going to deal with being at risk. I don't know. Maybe how, the voters will want to recall that person. How do I know? Ah, I so no now idea. we're coming up with a program that says, let's figure out how I'm we I'm not saying you, you're program. pushing me in that direction. I don't know what you're doing. Mikey, I'm, I, I want to know what I'm you think. I'm following your lead. This is your proposal. I just want to know where you think this is going to lead us 
And apparently it's a program that says if we can, we can get somebody. I have no knowledge. We can figure out maybe the residents will recall Bruce. And that was three minutes for Rosemary. So next we'll hear from Joe Drummond, followed by Georgia Goldfarb and Scott Dietrich. Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, I am. Honorable Mayor Grisanti and City Council, I hope that given everything said in that last video and the original intention of the investigation that the results and all information leading up to this investigation will be released to the public so no more questions exist. I call your attention to the letter to the editor of the Malibu Times that Mikey and Karen wrote jointly last week in which they call for two members of the LA County Committee on School District Organization to recuse themselves. They close the letter stating, as our nation faces an unprecedented attack on dem democracy itself, how can we expect our children to understand and embrace the principles of transparency, accountability, and the right to a fair process when we stand by as two members of the county committee trample on these principles of fairness? Please embrace and stand up for these principles of transparency and accountability as council members and release this investigation and all information having to do with it and the settlement agreement with Ms. Feldman. She has already left and been paid out, so there should be no reason for any disparagement upon her to come from this release, especially since it's an investigation into Mr. Silverstein and not into her, so it should not state that she did anything wrong and violate any terms of the agreement. There is also no reason why the Wagner investigation was released, yet this one is not released as of yet. Also, the residents of Malibu, Malibu should be seen as the clients and not the city alone. So we have every right to have access to this report and all confidential meetings having to do with this investigation. We'd also like to know how much this investigation cost. Thank you for doing what is fair and making the priority of the rights of the public. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Next, we have Georgia Goldfarb followed by Scott Dietrich and Ryan. Georgia, are you available? Uh, yes, I'm just trying to unmute there. You're unmuted. Okay, great. Um, dear Mayor and Council Members, as I have said previously, I believe it is critical to our commitment to transparency and fairness that the report of the investigation regarding Reva Feldman's charges be released to the public. It will help mend some of the differences between Council Members and the public and will allow us to move forward to solve the challenging issues before us. Reva is gone. Let us put this matter behind us. Please release the report. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. And next we'll hear from Scott Dietrich followed by Ryan and John Mazza. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, you know, every time council goes into closed hearings, it grates on me, and I know it grates on a lot of people in the city. There's times when you have to do it, discussing staffing or punishments to uh, someone or salaries. It, it, we understand that, but still it grates. This does not rise to something that needs to be kept from our citizens. It just doesn't. Yeah, I've read Reva's uh, uh, NDA that we can't disclose, blah, blah, blah. But this isn't about Reva. This is about Bruce investigating whether he committed really sexual uh, attack on Reva. I can't see that. What happened, of course, we know Bruce ran on a platform that he wanted Reva gone. And a lot of reasons for that, we don't need to go into it. So he started asking for a lot of information. Reva fought him on that. Didn't want anything recorded. Didn't want to give him that information. And then of course it got ugly. Um, so, I don't think that uh, Reva has anything to stand on because this is about Bruce. Were his actions over the line or not? So please release the report there. Two minutes. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Ryan, are you available, Mr. Embry?
Yeah, I didn't have an unmute until like two seconds ago. Okay. So my uh, comments are that we have to understand how we got to this point because city could get to this point on some other issue too, especially if the staff's going to withhold documentation, which was the impetus of um, a lot of the involvement of the requester. And I want to remind you that this was state law that was uh, voted into law as Proposition 59. And I'm gonna read it. It says, public records, open meetings, legislative constitutional amendment amends constitution to include public's right of access to meetings of government bodies and writings of government officials, preserves specified constitutional rights, retains existing exclusions for certain meetings and records, fiscal impact, potential minor annual state and local government costs to make additional information available to the public. And I want to put this in the context of the requests because there was an analysis of this by the First Amendment Coalition and by UCLA Berkeley. And this passed overwhelmingly by the citizens of the state of California. And this obligation is your obligation to abide by the state laws and all the people who took similar oaths. And so it was the Public Records Act where, unfortunately, um, the city did not comply and fell down. And I'd like to know, and you know, the requester, which was uh, Bruce, um, was very gracious and he waived timelines that are required for performance and production under the state act. And the requests that he made were not unreasonable because you know he was posting copies of this stuff on social media and the the strange um what would i call it denials and pushback from the city started to reveal a dynamic and our leadership was not capable and willing to comply with so i would like to see in this not just the re the interpretation of of whether the, you know i saw the the counterpoint was the letter when you can't do your job and you want to negotiate a, a golden parachute you send in a letter throw in some you know innuendos and see what you can get i want to know the city's statistical performance of complying with the public records act of the state of california and if it failed to do so under reva feldman's leadership I want to know why you rewarded uh, that person so graciously with a package. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we'll hear from John Mazza, followed by Howard Redsky and Lynn Norton. Hey, John, are you available? I am available. Um, I think I want to put this in perspective. The general public doesn't trust our government. Not all of them, but a significant amount because of things like this. And transparency, as Mikey and Karen and Paul said, is very important. And without transparency, you are not going to get the trust of your constituency. And you need that to govern. Now, what's happening is we're going to have a new city manager soon. How would you like to come into a city where the general population doesn't trust you're going to be honest? And how would you like to come into the city and deal with an item that was handled way before your term. Uh, it's not a good thing. You, we have to come in and clean the slate, have our citizens believe that it's an honest government and see all the facts. I've read the section that is where it's, it's Bill Sampson quoted and it's clear to me, and now it's not clear to uh, Mr. Cotty, but we're, we don't have a problem. But just as in the Jefferson case, everything was released. I found out what you think of me. I found out that I'm a Boacron, okay? Well, that's what you think, but at least I know it. It's not hidden. And the public needs to know that you were honest in the way you dealt with this. Remember, you, you denied the mayorship. You have talked about 
taking all the committee away from Bruce, and you're not telling the public why. And you're not telling the public what was alleged and what was true. And it's very important for the public to do that. People talk about what goes on in the social media, but it goes on because of this, not in spite of it. And you have a very significant part of the public that is not happy with what's going on in Malibu. And you should do the best you can to at least make them look at it with open eyes rather than thinking there's some conspiracy or there's some documents that are hidden for no reason. Uh, and there is no harm. It's over with. We've got her money. She's gone. Bruce got elected. He's here. We have an election coming. Our problem in Malibu is there's a fundamental disagreement about a lot of things that are happening, and the public does not trust as the government and as the city council why it's happening. So they want to know, and there's no reason why you shouldn't, and you promise to let them know. And they paid for it, as Bill Sampson said. So please release all the documents and be over with this. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Howard Redsky, followed by Lynn Norton. Hi, Howard. Are you available? I am. I uh, can hear you. Oh, okay. There it goes. It was a different pop-up this time. Good evening. I just like to say three things. The report's probably going to be released. Nobody's mind's going to be changed. And if there is another payout to Reba, people will complain. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Howard. Lynn, are you available? Uh, you are. I'm here. We hear you. Um, when you all voted to do this report, I was a little flabbergasted because I didn't see how it was in the city's interest um, to do this. And it was really an investigation of Bruce and especially if the if the report exonerates Bruce it would not it would be honorable to make that public because really what you did was you investigated Bruce so um I know that John said there's risks in putting it out but there's all I, I bet there's very few decisions that you guys make where there isn't a risk of saying yes and a risk of saying no there's very few things that you make where it's just all on one side of the equation. And and the risk of not putting the report out is is having a distrusting citizens. You know, it would be nice to, you know, it's always good to get the truth out. You know, even if some of it's rocky, it's always just still good to get it out, you know, and then just go on from there. So I just think it would be good for the city uh, good for the citizenry if you would release the report. And I actually hope it's a no-brainer if you would just all say yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And Mayor, that was our last speaker sign up, and I don't see any raised hands from the public, so that concludes public comment. Okay, we're going back to the council. Uh, Karen, I see your hand. I see Steve, Mikey's hand is raised against the non-contrasting background, and then the Karen's, followed by Steve's. Okay, sorry, is it Mikey oh, first? Who's that? Yeah, right. Mikey first. Mikey's, according to the computer, Mikey did it before you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I can come up with a red hand or something. I'm sorry about the background. I failed on the green screen. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, okay. I come from a world where every organization to be, to create any sort of culture people want to be involved in, investigates charges of harassment. So how that translates is went down. Uh, I mean, if we investigate, it was on a, you know, it was an internal investigation, but it's a little different in this case, a little different than say two staff members accusing each other of harassment or something like that. So, I thought the only way for full transparency was to do an HR investigation. And that's what we have here. And honestly, since day one, I've wanted this release. And 
Absolutely. And it took a while, but you just don't give up. And I believe not only did I bring this for it, I believe Karen seconded it. So you people asking for transparency, that's exactly what I think should happen. 100% always. I've said it before. I'll say it again. No matter how it looks or comes out, we absolutely have to be transparent and want to be transparent. I do agree with Howard. You know, it's probably, yes, it has to come out. Will it solve anything? I doubt it. But, you know, everyone will have their take on it. But, yes, I believe this report should come forward 100%. Um, the other interesting part here is I think Steve was asking to be able to talk about our conversations in closed session. I find that a lot harder. So are we going to agree to release basically hearsay with nothing recorded? That's going to be just a war. These were hard, hard conversations both ways. I, I'm much more comfortable with printed material that is verified. I don't really want to go to war. I want to try and work together and move forward if we can. Um, so I think you know where my vote is, 100%. We should release the report. I think it's about time. I hear Mr. Cotty and respect him 100%. I really appreciate you as our attorney. You're great. But I, I do believe that this absolutely needs to be released. And those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, if that was a motion to release the report, I'd like to second it, but I also have some comments. Um, so uh, for interim city attorney Cotty, uh, for anybody who hasn't read the report or has forgotten some of the details, the staff report on this item, there was a separation agreement report made to the public I think on April 27th, 2021, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And that reflected a council vote on the separation agreement. So can you remind us, was that council vote unanimous? Y yes, the council con considered this item in closed session on April 27th. And at that time, the council approved the settlement agreement, and I reported out publicly that the council unanimously approved the agreement. So yes, okay. the, the vote was unanimous. Okay, so all five council members approved the separation agreement. I think that seems to be misunderstood by some members uh, of the public who spoke tonight. All five council members agreed to the separation agreement and the terms. Um, there was a statement made Please release all the documents. I think there's a misconception among some members of the public that there is a set of notes backing up this final report as there was in the Wagner affidavit. So again, uh, John, Cotty, can you explain that? There is not. There is just the report and cover letter issued by the investigator, Attorney uh, Leslie Ellis. Okay, so everything else would that I believe that some people are being asked for would not be notes. Uh, it would be individual council members' recollections of closed session discussions. Is that your understanding as well? I, I I'm not sure what what request of the public you're you're referring to. I, I think the public is asking requesting a release of. The report, we will, if the council's pleasure, release that report. As to any notes that any council member might have taken in closed session, we don't keep copies of those. We don't keep minutes of closed sessions. We take notes and report out what we have to report out. But those are my notes, not public notes. So um, if the council wants to release conversations, that's a much more difficult issue this far after the fact. Typically, you'd make that motion during the course of the closed session, but I understand that the, that's not possible here. So it's up to the council to determine whether or not it can parse out. Um, I don't think you can parse out publicly, but you probably have to release everything and allow people to speak about the closed session from their perspective. Okay, 
I will just uh, reiterate my second to Council Member Pearson's motion to release the final report by Investigative Attorney Leslie Ellis. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Steve? Yes, uh, Mikey, let me be real clear. I thought it was clear what I did it the first time. What I'm looking for is the, the report to get released. I'd also like to get released the closed session communications from the attorneys, not from what we talked about, from the attorneys who, that spoke to the city council regarding the allegations contained in the January letter from Reba Feldman's attorney. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I, I would like to get released. I think those conversations are directly on point for what we're doing here. I think they will let the public know how our decision-making process transpired. Uh, and I think that is an important component of being transparent and letting people know, having some level of accountability. The rest of the closed set, I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd release all the closed sessions, but that's not my plan. I, I only want the com communications from the attorneys. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I just want to take a quick moment to let Scott know that there was never any allegation of sexual harassment. Gender-based discrimination is something entirely different. So we have a motion and a second to release the written report from prepared by the outside council. Uh, and I'd like to call a question. Uh, Kelsey, Paul, Paul, are we also going to? Are, is this vote also covering the attorney communications that were in closed session? No, it is not. The motion was not to. I don't. I don't know what attorney communications you're coming up with, but I didn't hear that in Mikey's conversation or Karen's. I, so I think I think we can get four votes for this, and then let's come back and talk about what you want. Well, Mikey, we talked about that the last meeting. I misunderstood what you meant, clearly. I, I'm i not even, I don't even remember. I do. Those emails, I'm sure they exist, but it's been a while, uh, obviously. I far, do. far too long. I do. Um, yeah, I have, I have, are you talking about letters from? I'm talking about what we were told in closed session from the attorneys re regarding the allegations contained in Reva Feldman's attorney's letter. That's what I'm talking about. The yeah. verbal, the verbal statements I'm, that were made. Yeah, to I don't us? Want to, I'm not trying to be dumb. I'm still trying to catch up with you here. I, I mean, if I could, I, again, this is closed session stuff, so I got to be very careful of what I say <laughs> and how I say it. And I'm uh, truly trying to understand you. There I, were just... there were attorneys that addressed us in closed session. Yes. And those attorneys commented on the letter that Reva wrote and the allegations in that letter. And I just, that's what I want to make public. But how are you going to make those conversations public? John's got them. John Cotty. Were they wow. conversations or were they written communications? I don't have any written communications from any attorneys. I can summarize the, I can summarize that the advice that was given in closed session. That's all I'm looking for. I, I don't think I I'm unfamiliar of what those documents say or anything, and I don't care. They're not documents is what it comes down to. They're just notes on our conversation. I, I didn't even know notes were available. If there's notes, I have no problem with that at all. There's I have nothing to hide. Zero. I just was having there, trouble understanding what you meant. There are no notes. It would just be my summary of the of the advice given in closed session relative to the separation agreement. And the allegations raised by Reva Bell. So with that, Paul, are we both voting on both of those things with this one then? I prefer we keep it separate. We've got a clear uh, desire to vote on whether or not we're giving the written. And I, I prefer that we have a separate motion and we try to figure out asking, asking John to generate a, uh, a set of notes for us. No, John can just relate what he knows, what he has recorded. Let's, let's, I'd like to call the question on the motion that was made, and then we can talk about a second motion. 
Okay. So we've got a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Uh, yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I would say to to uh, Steve's motion or his thought, I'm personally I'm fine with it, but I think we should release the report first, and then he can. I, mean, all the I don't same, know right? what's they're that. All, they're all tied together. Exactly. All, and so release them all at once. We can put it behind us. We don't have to play with it anymore. <laughs> like I said, I agree with Howard. This isn't going to make things a lot better, but yeah, we okay, need well, to release we, it either way. We, we need agree to release. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm speaking. Okay. Let me finish. We need to release it either way. I 100% agree. I'm Karen? sorry. I just wanted to finish my thought. You can, okay. and someone else. No. Can Go ahead, Karen. Karen. Uh, yeah, again, this is in the staff report for item 5A, but um, I would rather hear John Cotty comment uh, on what we're talking about right now and releasing uh, whatever report he made at that time and uh, what he thinks the risks are and, uh, and if that sets a precedent. And I, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I would like to hear from John about this. I want to be clear. There is no written report from any of the attorneys that appeared before you in closed session relative to the advice that was given. It was given orally to you in closed session. I can summarize that. Um, it would be, you know, the advice was the same. I can, I can summarize that for you, put it in a written document and attach that with the press release, putting out the report. Um, as with any release of confidential closed session communications or attorney client privilege document, there are risks. Um, you cannot, once it's done, you can't get it back. Um, perhaps as a compromise, you can release the report and revisit this um, at a future meeting. Um, that's one way to certainly handle it. Uh, again, it's the council's prerogative whether it wants to release it, but again, you're not releasing any written document beyond the report itself, you'd just be releasing my summary of advice that was given in closed session. And John, question, is that a summary that you would write based on our vote now? Yes. Or, or something you have in your records? I have in my records, but it's, it wasn't provided. I, did, I didn't prepare a memo for you, a closed session memo in this regard. So I would prepare a memo for you of my notes from that closed session but my notes are, are not anything that I would turn over. I would prepare a summary to be released. That's you said closed question. session singular, you meant plural, right? The advice was the same, but yes. Okay. But there were plural, there were many closed sessions. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I'll make a motion to once again release the communications we received from the attorneys it was given to the city council in closed session regarding the allegations that Reba's attorney put in her letter. And, and it just, it's transparency, guys. We, we want to be transparent. Steve. Yeah, Steve. Paul, Paul, I'm talking when I'm done. You're more than happy. It's transparency. That's all I'm asking for. Everybody's committed to that. So let's do it. Uh, Go ahead, Paul. I, Steve. I, I, oh, sorry. Steve, may I suggest that you construct your motion that you instruct John Cotty to prepare a summary of his instructions. I've got my motion. I made my motion. He, he will give us what we need. We just got to vote that we want it. He's already the, said you, what he can do. Your motion implies that it exists. He it existed. He's got in his head someplace he understands what they said he said that paul you don't you don't believe him i i believe that he understands that but your motion makes it seem like he already it already exists and it's a matter of pulling it out of a filing cabinet no it Karen? doesn't I, I i want release the communications from the attorneys i'm not saying i don't want written it doesn't have to be i was not pulling it out of someplace we know what they said it should be we should look right, tell us I think, uh, Mayor Grisanti, I think the motion implies that I would be preparing a document 
summarizing the advice of of myself and others in, in terms of the advice that was given to council in closed session. Thank you, John. Karen? Okay. Forgive my ignorance. Um, I don't know. John, is this something you're authorized to do, release the communication communications of other attorneys? This is your privilege. Okay. It's your privilege to waive. The advice was given to you in closed session by attorneys, but you're the holder of the privilege. Um, because it because of that, you have the right to waive it and release the information that was provided to you that assisted you in making decisions that you made. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarification. John, does this have any bearing on our future ability to have attorney client privileged conversations? It, it absolutely does. Um, you know, you're entitled. I know that the, uh, the public that is at this meeting is not going to want to hear this, but you're entitled to engage in closed session communications on various issues. Believe it or not, you actually do it very infrequently and you only do it with regard to personnel matters, to real estate negotiations and uh, labor negotiations, as far as I know. I've never seen you go into closed session for another reason. People are gonna be reluctant to provide you advice in closed session if, if it's gonna be released. People are, staff is not gonna be wanting to engage in real estate negotiations in closed session, which you're perfectly entitled to do because it perfects protects the public fisc, for example, um, if if everything is going to be released. Why even have the closed session in the first place? Um, is it a precedent setting? That's really up to the five of you. If this is a one-off thing, given the importance of the issue, I fully understand that. Um, if it's if it's something that's going to be continuous and could lead to problems down the road, it, it, it affects your ability to do to do business as a city. You're entitled to go into closed session in very specific instances and we are we guard that as your city attorneys very very closely we do not allow you to go beyond what's statute statutorily authorized in the code and again people might disagree with that but I, I think you all would agree that we're very very careful about closed sessions so again you're entitled to discuss these things in closed session again i appreciate the importance of this issue so if it's something that you want to release given that again it's your policy decision I hope that was a long-winded way of answering your question, but I'm happy to go further if you'd like me to. I think it's long enough, John. Steve? Yeah, I'm not asking for anything other than those two, the, the communication of those attorneys. The rest of the stuff, you can keep secret all you want. Mikey? I know it's hard to see my hand, I apologize. Um, I will second the motion in this instance, I understand the need for attorney client, you know, privacy and, and these meetings because we have to be able to discuss these things and, and releasing it over overall could be damaging to those negotiations or the city. But in this particular case, you know, I don't just like the Wagner report, I don't think it's going to help anything releasing everything, but I think we absolutely need to do it anyhow. Um, we need to get through this chapter in our city. It's been ugly and brutal and really hurt the city and we need to find a way to move forward. So I will second the motion. It's a motion and a second. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll? Council Member Yes. Yes. Council Member, I'm sorry, Council Member Pearson. Yes. Council Member Fair. Yes. Mayor Grisanti. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. We are I done will. with item 5A. We need Bruce Bruce. back. We should get Bruce back. Maybe we should take a quick, oh, it's a little yeah. early. Let's take a quick break and have Bruce come back and that we will all be on the same uh, schedule. Before we go, Mayor Grisanti, I just wanted to let the public know that we will work as diligently as we can to get those notes prepared and we'll release the report, the cover letter, and the notes at the same time. Okay. Thank, Thank you, John. John. Yes. Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, I don't. So I will see you all in 10 minutes. I think that'll give us enough time. And if my watch is right, which is doubtful, that would be about uh, 835, 838.
838, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Close enough. Close uh, enough. Bruce? Yeah, sorry for taking so long to get back. There's like a 30 or 30 second or one minute delay when you watch on YouTube. So it took, I didn't know you were done. <laughs> Okay, well, we were gonna we were gonna take a short break to give you time to to catch up and and uh, get us all refueled for the balance of the agenda. So we're gonna go ahead and leave for ten minutes unless you think we should press on. I think four a is gonna take a little time. It appears Councilmember Yuring has also already left the meeting for the recess. Okay, let's we're on the recess then. Let's see. We'll see you at uh, 838.
We have two. Mikey needs to turn. Here we go. Three. We have four. Seem to have lost Karen from my screen. Maybe give her another minute. It looks like she's not connected to audio either. Okay. She's reconnecting right now. Good, thank you. Hey, Karen. Okay, we are rejoining and the agenda brings us back at this point to item 4A, which is a coastal development permit and a bunch of other things. And I'm gonna jump right to the staff report. And I bet Adrian is gonna help us with that. I'll try to do my best. Um, next slide, please. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and members of the City Council. Uh, the subject property consists of two parcels, the Malibu Country Inn lot and the Point Doom Club lot. Uh, the project uh, development is almost entirely within the Malibu Country Inn lot, except for the deck uh, extends uh, outside the property boundaries. The Malibu Country Inn lot uh, takes access from Westward Beach Road uh, near its intersection with Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, there's a drainage well in between uh, Westward Beach Road and uh, PCH with trees, as well as trees on the subject property, which help screen the proposed, uh, the proposed uh, uh, restaurant building from uh, view uh, from PCH and neighboring properties. The drainage well is identified as a blue line stream uh, with associated ESHA pursuant to the local coastal program. The proposed development is in the Point Doom neighborhood. Uh, in Point Doom, uh, there's no ESHA buffer requirements from streams provided new development is sited on slopes flatter than four to one, or the slope does not drain directly into a stream. Uh, in this case, the site drains directly into Westward Beach Road and does not um, drain into a stream, uh, which is in this case on the opposite side of the street. Uh, therefore, the project was approved by the city bio biologist without a buffer from the ESHA that's within the, the um, uh, swell area. The local coastal program uh, parkland and trails system map identifies an unofficial proposed uh, market trail along the uh, southern portion of the property, uh, which extends around the Point Doom Club area. Uh, the city uh, council collectively decided to abandon uh, this program of the Trails Master uh, Plan, as well as uh, the associated uh, maps. Uh, staff is not aware of any public uh, trail easement for this trail, uh, nor will the proposed development obstruct its use, uh, current use or future use if there's ever a trail there. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed development is uh, for the replacement of the existing restaurant building. Uh, the permitted size of the existing restaurant is 954 square feet, which includes, um, and, and uh, excuse me, uh, the existing, uh, building size is that, however, 100 and 1,150 square feet uh, unpermitted addition uh, has been uh, constructed to that same building uh, and a unpermitted deck attached to the building uh, is currently there as well. Uh, the new restaurant is proposed to include a 2,343 square foot first floor area uh, a 277 square foot second floor area and a rooftop deck. Uh, the service area will increase from the existing 948 uh, square feet to the proposed 996 square feet. Code enforcement fees 
have been paid in form of an investigation fee for all unpermitted work on the property. The project also includes a replacement of a 200 square foot unpermitted storage shed uh, with a new 100 square foot storage shed uh, that will be moved away from the site property line uh, to meet the setback. Uh, replacement of an unpermitted ground level deck with a smaller deck in compliance with the setbacks and uh, reconfiguration of the existing parking lot to provide 40 parking spaces without increasing any non-conformities. Uh, next slide. So here's a list of discretionary requests uh, for the project. Uh, the applicant team is requesting a lot line adjustment between the Malibu Country Inlot and the adjacent Point Dune Club uh, mobile home park lot. The Point Dune Club lot is zone mobile home residential or MH. And the Malibu Country Inlot is zone CV1 or commercial visitor serving one. Um, both the Malibu Country Inn and the expanded land in the um, MH slot are proposed to be rezoned CV2, uh, and this is in order to, re to allow the property use to be uh, reclassified uh, from the existing motel and restaurant to a hotel. Uh, this uh, reclassification is subject to a conditional use permit and a parking variance. Uh, the parking meets the parking provisions of the motel and restaurant and the operation of the facility will not be altered uh, whether it is considered a hotel or a motel. A conditional use permit was previously issued for the restaurant, uh, but the motel remains a legal non-conforming use as it requires a conditional use permit in uh, the existing CD1 zoning district. Uh, variances are also requ uh, required for the construction of a staircase to comply with fire department access and deck and for the replacement restaurant not to comply with the city's geotechnical standards for factor safety. A site plan review is uh, required for the second floor and portions of the uh, restaurant's first floor to uh, exceed 18 feet in height, but uh, to maintain a maximum height of 24 feet uh, for a flat roof. A minor modification is requested for the restaurant to maintain the same general location, which requires a uh, reduction in the front yard setback. Uh, a demo, uh, demolition permit for the replacement restaurant, removal of on premise storage shed and partial demolition of the existing deck is also requested. Uh, all the same uh, discretionary requests would uh, would be required for the for only uh, the permitted portion of the restaurant building to remain. Uh, since the existing building would need the foundation to be altered uh, or um, uh, retrofitted, which would make the building a replacement building uh, per the uh, local coastal program. Next slide. Here's a site plan showing the location of the replacement restaurant over the existing uh, restaurant and staircase, uh, proposed staircase over the steep slope. Uh, the existing motel consists of three separate buildings uh, and existing parking is located along the entry uh, driveway and angle parking spaces behind one of the motel buildings. The parking will be modified to comply with the most uh, recently approved site plan, uh, which was approved around 1996. Uh, 12 of the existing parking spaces are not conforming due to size and aisle width. Uh, next slide. And here's a, a color-coded slope uh, analysis showing uh, the steep uh, slopes all around the existing development. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is the lot line adjustment exhibit showing uh, in shaded gray uh, the proposed area into Malibu uh, Point Doom Club lot. Uh, stated before, the shaded area areas are currently zoned uh, MH. And should the lot line adjustment be approved, the zoning and general plan maps would need to be updated to match the rest of the property. Uh, next slide. The uh, uh, these these are site photographs 
photos uh, that show the replacement restaurant building uh, with intermittent visual uh, obst uh, obstructions from PCH um, because of existing mature trees along uh, the street and on the subject property. Uh, the proposed uh, 277 square foot uh, second uh, story addition is also located towards the back of the building, which will be mostly obstructed by uh, the single uh, portion of single story portion of the residents uh, from a line aside uh, from PCH. Uh, this exhibit, or excuse me, this uh, these photographs show photographs taken um, from the rooftop deck. Uh, it should be noted that conditions have been added to the project, uh, such as condition uh, 31 uh, that requires no existing lighting on the restaurant's rooftop uh, deck is permitted. As part of this application, a future request for rooftop uh, lighting uh, requires a coastal development permit amendment or a new CDP. Uh, the restaurant's rooftop deck must not be used after dusk. Uh, other than the roof deck area, no exterior area may be used as the restaurant's uh, service area. Um, and this is uh, due to the uh, limited parking requirements as they would be using all of their uh, service area within the building or on the rooftop. Uh, and then condition 35 uh, is no amplified sound may be used uh, unless otherwise permitted with a uh, TUP. Uh, next slide. And again, these are just more photographs uh, showing the existing driveway and the motel buildings. Next slide. Uh, City Council member Uring uh, pointed out that there was an error in the second floor bar area. Uh, while the chairs uh, were included in the service area calculation, the counter space was not. Uh, the applicant provided the attached sketch uh, to show how the bar area can be modified to comply with the ser service uh, area uh, required for uh, the property staff uh, proposes the following condition uh, of approval uh, should the uh, council uh, chooses to uh, accept this, this change. Uh, the second floor area must be revised in compliance with the service area provision, provision uh, presented to the uh, city council during the January 24th, 2022 uh, meeting, the total uh, service area may not exceed 996 square feet and the portion of the counter used for pavement and uh, drink pickup may not be used for drinking or eating. Uh, next slide. In conclusion, staff recommends that the uh, city council adopts uh, resolution number 22-04 uh, and 22-05 uh, approving the proposed project and general plan amendment um, with the suggested condition of approval. Um, uh, and also for city council to direct staff to schedule uh, ordinance number 497 approving the uh, local coastal program amendment uh, for a uh, second reading and to subsequently uh, submit to the coastal commission for certification of the uh, local coastal program amendment. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Kelsey, do we have any public comments? We do. And first we'll hear from the applicant. I believe we'll have Lynn Heacock speaking. And if he has anyone else, I'm sure he'll let us know. Thank you. Mr. Hecox, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Mayor? We can hear you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much for your time. I also thank uh, Mr. Fernandez. Um, we get along relatively well. He's got different ideas than I do sometimes, but we, I think we're pretty much consistent with one another on this particular project. I also wanna thank city and county staff. Um, I have provided each of you a brief summary of the items I wanted to discuss, the first being the a very simple a very simple statement regarding the proposed replacement restaurant light line lot line adjustment um we want to replace a re restaurant initially built in 1955. we're also requesting a lot line adjustment to provide space for today's required setbacks some of our non-conforming uses 
We understand, however, that the city's zoning ordinance allows all legal non-conforming structures to be maintained indefinitely and rebuilt. Um, the Coastal Commission has similar requirements. We thank the city of Malibu for this code provision. Now the old restaurant and the replacement restaurant have similar footprints as depicted on some of the exhibits that Adrian has shown you, but the square footage cannot be directly compared due to some of the ADA um, Americans with Disability Act requirements. Square footage and parking, however, are still good measures of intensity. Let me read this. The old restaurant approved by the Planning Commission in 1996, and you don't need to write this down, was 204, 2,104 square feet with 41 parking spaces. The new restaurant has 2,620 square feet with 40 parking spaces. The new restaurant is 500 square feet larger, but with ADA requirements. ADA requirements require more floor space, larger aisles and service areas, larger restaurants, and an elevator for full accessibility. Additionally, new kitchens require ADA accessibility and considerably more space for refrigerated storage and preparation areas. Based upon the square footage and ADA requirements and parking, the two projects are almost equivalent or very close. Regarding violations, the violations should be reviewed with it with a different perspective. The violations involve only the restaurant. Malibu Country Inc. acquired the property in 1993, but the restaurant was controlled by a lessee. We are the responsible party for violations, but we do not over operate the restaurant. For our part, Malibu Country Inc. processed an extensive number of building permits in 1996 for the remodel and expansion of the motel, the front lobby, 125 feet of new retaining wall, and in 2013, a new advanced on-site wastewater treatment system. These projects were all signed off by the city and there were no violations. The violations on the restaurant occurred, and some of them still exist today, 20 to 25 years ago by a lessee and do not reflect the character of Malibu Country Inn, Inc. Let me discuss three variances. We have a variance for parking. As Adrian explained, we're required by code to have 40 parking spaces. Yes, we have 40 parking spaces. However, we have a reduced dimension of the parking spaces on uh, tw uh, tw 17 of the spaces. Spaces are required to be nine by 20. Housing spaces are 10 by 18, but standard spaces for commercial are nine by 20. We have 20, nine by 20. We have 17, nine by 18, which is satisfactory for a house, but not for commercial. And we have three ADA. The reduced dimension parking spaces were approved as Adrian indicated by the Planning Commission and Coastal Commission in 1996. The sizes of the spaces are non-conforming, but they are consistent with the zoning ordinance for rebuilds. Just for the record, I should mention that for the record, the code allows shared parking spaces, which would reduce the overall parking requirements to 30 spaces. We are not requesting shared spaces. We just want to be, make sure that the, the city council knows that we have adequate number of spaces on site. The second variance is for slope uh, construction on slope steeper than two and a half to one. The fire department is requiring us to build a second emergency stairway up to the restaurant on slopes exceeding two and a half to one, which is 40%. We're also making water, water improvements for the fire department. This is the stairway for public safety. The third variance, we're asking for a factor of safety of 1.268 that exceed that, excuse me, we're asking for a variance of safety that of 1.268 in lieu of 1.5. I do not think a variance is necessary. This is an option for the building and safety department. The LIP, the local implementation plan, references the geotechnical guidelines and the building code, and they do not require a 1.5 factor of safety to rebuild if the damage was not due to landslide, settlement, or slippage. Our damage was due to old age. The city building official 
has worked previously with property owners in the past to allow reconstruction of legal non-conforming structures to be, re to be rebuilt if the damage was not due to, again, landslide settlement of slippage. There have been many legal non-conforming structures rebuilt after fires in Las Flores Heights, Rambla Vista, Big Rock, and so on. Many structures were built with a factor of safety of 1.2. I believe many city council members, past and present, are aware of this. The Malibu country in itself sits on a bench cut, bench cut 50 feet above Coast Highway and 50 feet below Point Doom Club with a row of homes at the top of the slope looking down on us. There have been no problems to the homes above us or property below us or, pro or our property for the last 67 years. There have been no slope failures affecting Coast Highway in this particular area. The building official, Yolanda Bundy, and the city geologist have approved the rest restaurant with a factor of safety of 1.268. That is their discretion. Um, the issue has come up regarding the Zuma Canyon Creek buffer zone. We have been advised that our restaurant may be within the 100 foot buffer zone of Zuma Canyon Creek. The city biologist, Dave Crawford, disagrees. Our front setback from our property line is 37.3 feet and 97.3 feet from the western edge of Westward, Westward Beach Road. The city biologist made a site visit in 2018 and possibly again in 2021. The creek is over 20 feet beyond Westward Beach Road. We're over 100 feet from the creek. The city biologist approved our project in 2018 and 2021. We're not required, we were never required to go to the ERB and he signed off the matter specifically in both 2018 and 2021. The restaurant service area, we've been advised by planning staff that we've done some errors in our calculations. Our architect has made some modifications and showed those to Adrian. Adrian didn't think those were, were reasonable. We will work with Adrian to complete the service areas to meet our requirements of the exact same service area that we're being approved of tonight. If Adrian doesn't like what we're gonna do, we'll change it. We can't fight Adrian Fernandez. We can't fight City Hall at the staff level. They come up with reasonable conclusions, reasonable conclusions to me in my opinion, and I accept them. Uh, the last issue was the septic system. I noticed on one of the pieces of the correspondence, people are again talking about the septic system being concerned about the discharges and effluent and so forth. Again, in 2013, Malibu Country Inn spent a quarter million dollars and obtained building permits for an advanced on-site wastewater treatment system for the Malibu Country Inn and Restaurant. The system can serve 37 beds. We have 32 beds. The system can serve 120 restaurant seats. We have a maximum of 78 seats. The Malibu Country Inn handled the permit process and obtained all the city approvals. Mr. Mayor, council members, we have a lot of discretionary measures, but it comes down to maybe one variance for parking that's maybe partially significant, one variance for a factor of safety, which is actually the discretion of the building official that you've hired and accepted her to enforce the building codes, and everything else is customary. Whether you've got a site plan review for a building that goes 18 feet to 24 feet, the building has always been close to 24 feet. We're in an area that's not visible. We're not impacting some future trail that doesn't currently exist. We're not proposing any grading. The site has never had any evidence of instability. We'd like to rebuild the restaurant. We've been working here for four years. We've been paying bed taxes to a, rest, to a motel that's practically going out of business. We need the restaurant to make our, uh, to make our business uh, feasible. And people are concerned about a motel and increasing the intensification to a hotel. They're essentially both the same. We have a different parking standards for a hotel and a hotel normally has a restaurant within. Have I gone over my 15 minutes? I've got four You're more right. minutes, but I apologize. I had to check my clock, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, it's the same allowable uses. If we have a hotel zoning, and we don't care if it's a hotel zoning C2 or C1. 
we're going to keep the motel, we're going to keep the restaurant. If somebody wants to put up a hotel, they can put up a hotel with a restaurant inside. The parking standards are more. Uh, the room, the room amounts are more. But essentially, what we're doing is consistent with the C2 zone or the C1 zone. Um, I'm rambling now, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I apologize. Um, I would like the council to agree to our agree to staff's recommendation of approval and. If you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to attempt to ask them. I mean, answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hecox. Do would you like to reserve the remaining three minutes and forty-two seconds? I'm, I'm going to. We'll reserve it if you want to come back. How's that? Do we have any public comment? We do have public comment. John, do we need to listen for any disclosures before we hear from all the members of the public? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, if you had any disclosures that you'd want to make, now would be the time to do it. The agenda I have shows that that happens after public comment, but I'll be glad to make my disclosures now. Uh, I have, uh, I have uh, talked to Mr. Hecox today. Uh, didn't learn anything that he didn't just say to everybody and i have uh written back and forth with with several members of the public who asked me about this project and in the past i'm friendly with a couple people in uh, bonsall who have talked to me about this project and their primary complaint at that time was uh noise which i believe has been addressed by the uh the no amplified music thing. Other than that, I have nothing to report. Mr. Uring? Uh, yes, I've been to the restaurant in the past, not recently. Uh, and I spent some time talking to Adrian, going through the uh, resolution and the staff report and have made some comments and learned some stuff back and forth talking to him. Nothing that isn't there, just sort of getting a deeper understanding of what they were thinking when they did what they did. Thank you, Steve. Mikey? Um, thank you. I um, I know the property well. My brother-in-law used to be the manager, I think of the whole property, I think the hotel part a number of years ago. Um, no impact on now. I did not, I know Lynn from the past when I was a planning commissioner, um, good guy to be honest. And um, Oh, I did discuss the project with uh, um, Count uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bruce today on a phone call we had. I did not learn anything new. And that's that's it. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Uh, I've just received the emails that I believe all the council members have received from the public on this, um, have received one or more emails from the applicant have not engaged in communications with anybody on the applicant side. Uh, I did discuss this today with both uh, Adrian and uh, briefly Richard Malika, who put me together with Adrian. I've been to the restaurant many times back when it was Christie's. That was some years ago that they moved. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? So um, last week I had a call, Zoom call for about an hour, maybe 90 minutes with uh, Richard and Adrian and also Trevor uh, Rusin and John Cotty to get a better understanding of the legal issues surrounding the um, proposed project. Um, didn't I, I mean I, I learned I learned more about the law. Didn't learn anything about new about the specific project itself, but I learned more about how the law works with respect to the project. Um, and as Mikey said, as part of, I, I meant to comment on this earlier tonight during general comment, Mikey and I have been trying um, on a weekly basis, if not more, to just chat with each other and gain some camaraderie. And in the course of a long, much longer chat, we just briefly spoke about this project earlier today, didn't learn anything new, didn't form any definitive conclusions of any sort. Those are my disclosures. Thank you, Bruce. I believe that puts us at public comment. Correct. Yes, 
and we have nine speakers for you. The first few are Bill Sampson, Suzanne Gildeman, Joe Drummond, and Salvatore Fish. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Thank you. Bill, are you available? I am here. We're listening. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My concern is that this appears to be a lot of exceptions to existing rules. And as a matter of uh, my philosophy and what I would hope would be yours in light of the vision and mission statements, uh, you would not be wedded to laundry lists of exceptions. Um, I think I ate in the restaurant a couple of times. It must have been 20 or 25 or 30 years ago. I don't even know what it was called then. Um, had a nice time. Um, the, uh, the concern has been expressed to me by uh, several residents, and I, I was not here then. Prior to 1970, the market trail, which I believe does cross this property, was used by the public. At the very least, you folks ought to investigate that or have it investigated. If those folks pop up, there will be trouble in the form of people seeking an implied public dedication. I'm not gonna do it, I wasn't here. I've never walked on that trail. Uh, well, I may have get into the restaurant when I ate there, but if I did so, I did so unknowingly. Uh, the main concern, another concern is that changing to a hotel, as I understand it, and some of the technical, I probably don't understand or know particularly well, is in the future that will give the property owner or a future property owner more entitlements to build more stuff, make it higher, increase density. I don't think we need a lot more of more hotel, excuse me, more hotels out here. I guess it's already a motel with a bunch of variances. I don't think you should add any more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. And next we'll hear from Suzanne Gildeman, followed by Joe Drummond, Salvatore Fish, and Georgia Goldfarb. Hi, Suzanne, are you available? Hello, yes, I am. Um, the zoning change is permanent. The ownership of the property is not. What happens when the next owner wants to build a bigger hotel? We were just told that the drainage from this project ends up on Westward Beach Road, and because of that, it won't impact Zuma Creek. Where exactly does staff think that water goes when it reaches the road? Of course, it's going to drain into the creek. Where else would it go? Fire is a serious concern at this location. We've had numerous small fires in this area. Just in the three years since Woolsey, we've had transformer fires, illegal campfires, vehicle fires, if we're serious about fire safety in Malibu, we should never grant a variance that impacts fire safety. The staff report makes it appear that this project does not have a fire turnaround. If so, it needs one. If it can't meet that requirement, it should not receive a parking variance. There are families who lost their homes in the Woolsey fire that still can't rebuild because they don't have room for a fire turnaround. Giving this commercial project a waiver that residents can't get is a brutal double standard. I would like to see the property owner fix their code violations before being rewarded with multiple variances. Variances are discretionary. We don't have to grant them. Uh, nothing against the owners. It's a nice motel. I'd like to see it stay a nice motel and not be given uh, the zoning change to be a hotel. I worry about the future. Thanks very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Suzanne. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Salvatore Fish, Georgia Goldfarb, and Pat Healy. Are you available, Joe? Yes. Uh, apparently, Rosemary Idu is going to donate one minute to me. I don't think that uh, we're doing donating minutes. Oh, we're not? I don't think so. I don't think we changed that rule. And oh. Bruce is shaking his head. So I don't know if he means he's e agreeing with me yeah. or. I propose that we do that and I got voted down, so we don't do it. Oh, okay. okay. We just do Thank it in you. planning commission. Okay. All right. 
sorry. Honorable Mayor Grisanti and City Council, this is yet another hotel and restaurant project with three variances, a site plan review for height and multiple discretionary requests, et cetera, that affect the safety and tranquility of many residents. The project once again cannot satisfy the factor of safety of building in the slope, yet city planning says it's okay to build when the codes say it's not. This is another after the fact build that is trying to push through while fire rebuilds and small projects can't even get off the ground for years. There are six major issues. It cannot satisfy the factor of safety requirement. It is a risk to homes and beachgoers. The slope above could slide onto buildings, risking the patrons and employees. We have had too many slides due to overdevelopment in Malibu, including Big Rock, and the city will constantly be liable. Two, it'll be too high and will block scenic views. Three, the staff report states incorrectly that no trails will be affected, yet there is a trail, the market trail. And the blue line streams would not be protected by the additional development and various applied for construction. California Coastal Act Section 30240 states that environmentally sensitive habitat areas shall be protected against disruption of habitat values and development in areas adjacent to ESHA shall be designed to pre prevent impacts which degrade those areas. This property is clearly adjacent to the Zuma Lagoon wetlands. The staff report indicates that the proposed project is the least environmentally damaging alternative. However, this is not correct. The least environmentally damaging alternative would be for the property owner to upgrade the existing buildings and maintain the existing square footage and existing structures. Four, there is not enough parking for a hotel restaurant, urging more people to park on the street, taking up valuable parking and promoting more traffic in an already busy area. Staff noted sh should be more like 10 employees rather than only four, and the restaurant should have more than just 10 spots allocated. They are short at least 16 spaces. Neighbors point out that ingress and egress is already overburdened and operates at a standstill during the summer months, as does PCH at this location. Rewarding the project with a change of zoning to hotel investing future interests that could be expanded where there will be even more safety and traffic issues is wrong. This leaves open the possibility of increasing the size of every building. The hotel project requires secret review for environmental traffic, et cetera, and an initial study at least could address a number of these issues and potential impacts should be explicit about future implications of the hotel's de designation. Five, in accordance with the Malibu Municipal Code, the on-site wastewater treatment must be up upgraded. Due to the geology and changes in environmental factors since 2013, the out-system should be reinvestigated and any expansion prohibited. Six, the fire department in allowing a steep staircase fire escape in lieu of a driveway turnaround. This is not fair to fire rebuilds who can't get permits because their personal driveway, et cetera, does not have a large enough turnaround. Also, how is this disability and elderly accessible? At the very least, a condition should be put on the project not to allow any future expansion. Given the regular code violations, it requires this at minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And next we have Salvatore Fish, followed by Georgia Goldfarb, Pat Healy, and Scott Dietrich. Hi, Sal, are you available? Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, city members, city council members. Can you hear me? We hear you. Oh, okay, great. You know, I think Susan and Joe uh, did an outstanding job. They're obviously very intelligent and really spent a lot of time in reading the staff's report. I think what, uh, I don't know of anyone that I've talked to, and I've talked to quite a few people. I've lived on Bonsall since uh, the early, actually 1970, we purchased here. Uh, so I'm directly underneath their project. And uh, the thing that struck me most when I first read the staff's report was all the unpermitted things that were done by the owner uh, who gave a very elegant speech, I thought this evening, uh, but he seemed to put the emphasis on someone else other than the fact that he was the owner. It was the restaurant's fault or these things happened not because of him, but he is the owner and he still is. And what I'm concerned about, the staff has done just an unbelievable job of painting this all these variances is no big deal. I'm not a uh, politician, I'm not an engineer, I not, do not work for the government, I don't have the resources or the time to go into all the detail that the staff has, but it seems to me that we've got an individual that has already proven that he doesn't go exactly by the rules. Why is he gonna go by the rules that 
he's put in that you're putting on the requirements to okay this project when he didn't do it in the past. I think everybody wants to see a nice motel, not hotel, and a nice restaurant in this property. But he mentions the noise, and, and you mentioned it, uh, Mr. Mayor, that it doesn't seem to be a problem. Well, just two months ago, they had two events. I don't know if there were weddings or whatever, uh, and there was no restaurant. So it must be the owner that gave the permit to have this happen or that took the money to let whatever the function was that went well after 11 o'clock at night, very loud, comes right down the canyon. And I love music. Uh, you know, I've gone sometimes when Christie's did the same thing and said, gee, I'd like to sit up and listen to music, but I don't appreciate it coming down into my bedroom until one o'clock in the morning. So I, I just, it's just a very frustrating, but I think you, Mr. Mayor and the city council, you have a real, real job ahead of you. And I don't see it that difficult. I think he should be able to have a motel, not a hotel. He should have to do all the things that everyone as a normal person here in Malibu has to do to rebuild. I don't think he should be given any no, special treatment. And I will enjoy sending people to this motel and eating there myself, but please be a good neighbor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sal. And next we have Georgia Goldfarb followed by Pat Healy, Scott Dietrich and Ryan. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and council members, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as many have stated before, this project is at odds with Malibu's mission statement of preservation of the natural environment and regulatory requirements. The lack of compliance, as noted, is protean. Sloped stability, for example, is inadequate for development. <clears throat> the proposed structure will increase the odds of landslide to surrounding homes, patrons, and beachgoers. Short-term gain should not supersede long-term safety. The proposed changes will turn a motel into a hotel, which is not permitted. Please see Joe Drummond's and others' comments on size, configuration, and proposed use, including a rooftop bar, room service, restaurant, and events. Further, parking is entirely inadequate. Uh, this is really well documented and previously well detailed. Uh, increased traffic will add just another bottleneck to BCH traffic. <clears throat> and further damage, previous damage, excuse me, to natural habitat and inadequate upkeep of the property should not be an excuse to not protect ESHA and to not restore what owners have essentially desecrated. The premise cannot be that by destroying native habitat, one then has the license to ignore protection that would otherwise have been required. By the same logic as owners use, ESHA destroyed is no longer ESHA. It cannot be that we first destroy so we then can develop. Our obligation to preserve natural habitat and support Malibu mission is not being upheld if this project is approved. Please deny this project as currently configured. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia. Who do we have next? We have Pat Healy, followed by Scott Dietrich, Ryan, and John Maza. Thank you. Pat, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, the Malibu Coalition for Slow Growth asks that you uh, deny this project is designed. Uh, if you're considering approving it, more studies need to be done. Uh, the, as for the ESHA, the staff report fails to recognize the property is within 100 feet of the Zuma Creek Blue, uh, Blue Line stream. A uh, runoff from this site will go into the creek, and this creek flows down, down, downstream into a wetland. The ocean outfall is not only a designated area of special biological significance, but also it's a, it's a state the Point Doom State Biological Conservation Area. The, the impact of this project on downstream has yet to be determined. 
and we're wondering how the city can allow expansion of the restaurant when the existing parking is both substandard and inadequate. Many more than four employees parking spaces are needed and to operate the expanded restaurant. We estimate that probably for the restaurant alone, eight spaces are needed. We're overnight guests, restaurant patrons, and motel and restaurant employees going to park since there just is not enough parking on site. Um, also, a traffic study needs to be done because the ingress and egress to this site onto Westwood Beach is already overburdened and at a standstill during the summer months. As far as stormwater is concerned, instead of allowing stormwater to run off the property into the creek, a study needs to be done to see if the stormwater could be directed to an inside on-site de detention basin. This is important for groundwater replenishment, and especially in this time of drought and to protect Zuma Creek. Uh, again, the fire um, requirements of a steep um, stairway uh, seems quite ridiculous to us, but uh, we're just wondering how they'll get the needed equipment up there. Is there enough water fire flow on the site to meet the firefighting requirements? Um, all this is yet to be analyzed. And is there safe evacuation plans for the motel residents and the diners at the hotel? Um, and again, like the others, we are wondering why the safety factor is being waived. Um, as far as geology goes. Um, this is important since third parties lives could be endangered uh, if there's a major earthquake. Um, and as far as noise, I think the neighbor said a quick, uh, the sound of the residents. Uh, thank you, Pat. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich followed by Ryan and John Mazza. Hi, Scott. Thank you. Are you available? Yeah, I we can I'm hear you. Not, um, we're going to look really foolish if this permit is granted and it, the building is immediately sold to another developer for a hotel. It's one thing to repair an old building, but that's not what this is. This is changing the entire purpose from a motel to a hotel, and there's a very large difference. The other thing that I think we, we really need to look at, you guys on the council, and I think this is really the crux of all this, is it seems like our staff wants to approve every project that comes along if they need 20 variances, we'll give them 20, they're no big deal. And I think we're violating our mission statement. We're supposed to, in Malibu, forego a number of amenities that people in other cities come to expect. And we do so purposefully to protect the rural character of Malibu not only for ourselves, but for our visitors, because that's why they come. They don't want to go to Newport Beach. If they want to, they go there, or Santa Monica. And I don't, I don't get it. Uh, the staff does seem to be pro-development. And, you know, I know each of you guys, you're not pro-development, and yet step by step, building by building concrete by concrete, we seem to be ignoring, turning our backs on our mission statement. We're gonna lose our rural character. So we, we've got to just stand up, tell staff, look, if they've got a variance, unless it really benefits the citizens of Malibu, don't come, don't bring it to, council don't bring it to planning just it you can't have the variances we don't need that for commercial buildings i'm not talking about residential that's different but we've got to stop this commercialization of our city 
And I urge you to just step back and say, we've got to change this. Let the guy, you know, rebuild uh, the motel to upgrade it. Sure, that's fine. But not with this crazy development after development after development. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by John Maza. Mr. Emery, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Um, I, I just wanted to mention to Salvatore, um, that wasn't the owner speaking. That was an extremely talented and well-paid expediter on the behalf of the applicant. Uh, I remember hearing Lynn Hecox 20 something years ago, and maybe he's the only guy who could possibly get this thing this far uh, because he's that good. Um, the parking issue here is, is really just deplorable. I don't think it's even solvable. The gross parking area and the net parking area you got to figure that out because the fire department needs to be able to get up there and they'll show up for medical emergencies. They don't, not just the places on fire, but um, I don't think they'll defend it. If we had another event like Point Doom, it's not a dwelling. And if they don't defend it, it's going to um, continue the fire onto the adjacent residential property. And that would be terrible. So they have to figure a way to get their access in. Now let's talk about space size. And it is particularly about the length. What I did not glean from the report, and you know, that was that was the expediter's recital for 15 minutes. That wasn't the staff report. I want each of you council members to, to have the staff explain everything that was not accurate in the uh, applicants uh, recitals there. But the, the length of the parking spaces for compact is shorter. And the city code allows, I think, 25% compact spaces generally. And so the spaces that are non-compliant, are we just talking about the ones beyond the 25% that are already short and compact? Because if these, there's no enforcement of, of somebody parking a Suburban or an Escalade in a compact parking space, they'll probably take two, but it's gonna stick out into the fire access area by an additional two feet. And I haven't looked at this under a microscope, but if you have spaces that back up against each other and the aisle is down the middle, now you've just narrowed the necessary fire access by four feet. And I would say that it's unacceptable for you to be approving reductions in the required parking, especially at complicated places like this where there's big elevation problems, especially that aisle width because access is necessary. So um, it's under parked, and I would suggest that you have them submit a plan B because I think they have one and I think it's gonna be a better project. It needs more brain power because this is a severely constrained site. And the number of variances um, tells you you got problems that are not solved. So please send it back. Thank you, Mr. Embry. Our next speaker is John Mazza. Mr. Mazza, are you available? Yep, I just got my muted thing off. Uh, I'm going to take a different tack. This pro project is build it and we will approve it. This this restaurant was approved for 900 and something square feet. You hear Lynn Keacock tell you, oh, it's 2,400. It's 900 and something square feet approved. They got a code compliance 10 years ago. The proposal is to tear the restaurant to the ground, not leave one stick in the ground. They call it a remodel. The reason they call it a remodel is so the fire department won't have a turnaround. Well, so the fire department has to carry their hoses up a two and a half to one slope on a stairway to, and turn on the water 50 feet below them. They can't do it, okay? If you've ever carried a hose and Mikey has, he knows it, okay? This, this property is substandard on geology. The hotel is directly next to a one-to-one -one slope. If the slope fails, it falls right on the hotel. Now, the main thing is you're proposing to spend about $5 million to fix Westward Beach Road for traffic. 
This is uh, one of the identified worst traffic intersections in Malibu with death accidents. And whenever you have a wedding there, and that's what this is, it's a wedding venue with a giant deck on the top so they can have a wedding venue, you're going to have 30, 40 cars parked on Westward Beach Road, and you just wasted $5 million. So there's a lot of things here that are basically trying to make a project that is way out of compliance by a scoff law, not by permit, that has made this a problem. So they want to build an event center, build a big restaurant. This is not conducive for a hotel and a big restaurant and events. There's no place to park. There's no place for a fire truck to turn around. The aisles are too narrow for a fire truck to get up there and get back. And there's a myriad of problems. When, this, when the city says, calls Bush, I mean, Bonzel Creek, a swale, when you know that there's been major floods through there, they've plugged the tunnel up and it goes directly into the beach. And you know, anybody who's ever driven there, you know the water's not going down the inland side of the road drainage from this, it's going into the creek. It's just no question about it. So there's a lot of problems. You could go into a million details, but the this should never be a hotel, ever be a hotel. It cannot take it. And it's planned so it can be okayed with a bazillion variances to allow a hotel not to approve, not to fix a motel. And that's what the plan is. That's why you have so many variances. Never get a CV1 and send it back for required when it goes to coastal EIR. John, that's your time. Thank you, John. And we do now have a raised hand from Lonnie Gordon. So we'll unmute her next to see what she has to say. Thank you. Lonnie, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. I did not expect to speak tonight. I sent a letter in regarding this issue. And um, Mayor Paul, yours is the only one that was returned to me. And I'm not sure why. I thought maybe you blocked me. <laughs> No, I didn't block you. I sent it to the city address and it came back. But I did say, um, I, I copied a lot of what Joe had said and added my own comments to it. But after listening to all the speakers, I have to agree with all of what they've said. But I want to add a couple of things that I've observed because I live right down the street from the motel um, in the Bay Villas right above the cliff. And um, that intersection, especially during the summer, is so congested. Um, and one of, as you know, my issues is fire safety in Malibu. Right on that corner, on that right-hand turn that goes from Westwood Beach Road to PCH, is a very large 5G uh, telecom installation with two to three large boxes hanging down. Across the street from the motel is a very dry brush area. In fact, I wanted to contact someone from the city to see if we could get that cleaned out. There were a lot of homeless people living in there and they're not there anymore, but it's, it's tinder. It's just tinder dry. My concern is also about the fire department being able to reach that motel if there's a fire that's a very steep incline to have to run up or go up and there is no turnaround and there's no way for handicapped people to get down so um basically i agree with what everyone said and i'm just adding that on and thank you for giving me the time i appreciate it thank you lonnie do we have any other speakers that was the final public speaker, but we should circle back to Lynn and see if he has any other response with his three minutes and 40-ish seconds. Thank you. Lynn, are you available? Mr. Hecox, are you there? Lynn, you should have a pop-up ask you to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Can you give me a... Uh oh, I lost you. No, we're here. We hear you. Thank you. I can't see you at all. Um, I, I think the, uh, the citizens of Malibu, I appreciate all your comments. And you mentioned rural character. I, I agree with that, the rural character. 
a lot of you indicated it would be great to just rebuild the restaurant that we're proposing that we have right now. The restaurant we're proposing is going to be equivalent to the restaurant that was there already. Yes, it's 516 feet square feet bigger, but it's going to be within the same footprint of the existing building and it will reflect the rural character. Yes, if we have a hotel zone, I don't care if it's a hotel zone or a motel zone. We're still stuck with a rural character, which is a, every commercial project in Malibu is stuck with, a 0.15 floor area ratio. We currently have a 0.09 floor area ratio. That's what is being proposed. Can we build more? No. Why? Because the area has a lot of severe constraints. You mentioned the severe constraints. We have severe constraints. We have a 0.90. You mentioned fire safety. The fire trucks are allowed to drive just like they did at the fire zones. Up Cuthbert, up some of the other birds, ways in West uh, Malibu. They can drive forward on a road 150 feet on a 20% road and they can back out. They don't need a turnaround. That is the code. You can drive 150 feet. The fire department gave us an access plan showing the road driving up the driveway less than 150 feet and then backing down the same way. They can drive a fire truck up all the way up. However, they wanted a secondary access for in case they were just going to park a truck at the bottom. They also wanted a water improvement at the bottom. We're giving them a water improvement and a fire hydrant and a stair to walk up the, off the slope. They can have a truck go up the slopes. They can have a stair go up the slopes. Regarding the creek, again, all of our drainage will go in the creek. All of the drainage at Zuma State Beach will go in the creek. All of the drainage from the homes across the street on Bush and Bonsall will go in the creek. All the drainage from Coast Highway will go in the creek. However, once this restaurant is approved, we're complying with the water quality mitigation plan being approved by the water quality by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. The water quality mitigation plan requires all of our drainage that goes down the driveways and into the street and into the creek to first be filtered. I don't know if that's a six foot diameter activated charcoal filter. I don't know if they use diatomaceous earth. I don't know the compounds. I do know that it requires that requ somebody to inspect it every six months and change the filtering necessary. Um, okay, you have about 50 seconds, seconds left. Violations. In 2011, when I was hired, I went and looked at a plan. The last plan I looked at was one in 2011, and I started going through all the archives, and I said, what is this? They've got a, a huge addition, not a huge, several hundred foot restaurant addition and deck over the property line, and it was approved by the city planning department for a complete remodel. I went through the records and realized that the records weren't that readily available. Staff was looking at an interior remodel. They didn't know there was a violation extending over a property line. I told it to the property owner. I told it to Malibu, Malibu Country Inn, Inc. I said, do you know that, that somebody has put a building over the property line? It's been approved. They go, it's been operating by uh, Christie's Restaurant for the last five years. What do you mean? It's a violation. I said, it's a violation. That's your time. Thank you. Thank you. Kim. I see. I see Yolanda Bundy's uh, hand is raised. Hi, Yolanda. Hi, good evening. Um, just adding to the record and uh, setting up the record straight. Also, there was a statement done at the beginning of Mr. Hickok's uh, presentation stating that the building official and the GEO team had up to approve a variance for a safety of factor. Just to make the record straight, um, this project was never presented to us as a replacement of a restaurant nor a hotel. Um, the scope of work that I have for our review, um, we have done two reviews, one in November 8, 2018, and one on May 20, 2019. The scope of work for under those reviews, then that's where it's for the geo, uh, geo team, was a lot line adjustment to an existing restaurant, a remodel and a minor addition. That was the scope of work. So just wanna clarify um, that we never 
approve nor give a variance for a complete replacement of a restaurant or a hotel. And I have also the geotechnical team in here, just in case you have additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Steve, I see your hand. Yes, uh, Yolanda, thank you very, very much. And thank you to all the speakers. I mean, I think you guys did a superb job. Uh, you know, finally getting some references back to the general plan, the vision and mission statement, I think is, is exactly direct, the direction we want to go. Now, I've been on the planning commission for four years prior to getting up here, and I don't think I've seen a project with this many variances or dis discretionary requests. I mean, I, I, I want to borrow a line from Suzanne Goldeman. I mean, the only thing the staff is not giving this guy is a pony. Uh, everything else is included in that staff report. So it is it is really an amazing process. Let me just run through a couple of things that give me some heartburn, and then I'll pass it along. I, I'll hit more later on. Uh, I took a look at the assessor's office for this project, this property. The assessor lists this property as being 4,139 square feet. If you go to the staff report, the staff report says it's 9,790 square feet. That's the difference of 5,651 square feet. Now, I don't know if all of that was illegal development. I don't know why all that hasn't been reported to the assessor's office, because they're certainly not paying real estate taxes on it. Uh, but, but that kind of stuff is just very difficult to explain to a resident. I mean, how come these guys get all this discretionary stuff and I can't get my house built? I can't get the, I spoke to a person today that bought a house on, on the, the beach that has probably been revised, I don't know how many times, six times, five times, you know, 15, $20 million house. And staff went out there and took a look at it and found out that her garage had been converted from a garage to a pool table room. And they red tagged her house. All right. I mean, why explain that to these people? If there's, there's no explanation of why we let the commercial guy get away with this much stuff and we're taking our residents who are you know, living in the city, helping us out, and we're, we're penalizing them for that kind of stuff. Um, the quality, of, and Scott Dietrich, I think, brought it up. Some of the quality of the staff decision-making we're getting in this stuff is questionable. And I'm not going to go back to talk about what Scott did. Let's take a look at what the staff report says. And if you go to page 17 of the staff report, it says that uh, parking spaces which are currently functional could not be expanded to meet code requirements unless the existing motel buildings are re reduced or eliminated. Additionally, as stated above, other hotels in the city have reduced parking spaces, and they're using that as an excuse that says we're not granting special privileges to this piece of property. Now, think about that. They're saying I underparked, I made a mistake over here, and I underparked it, but I'm going to use that now as the precedent to go back and do it again someplace else, to do it again someplace else. So if you like sort of the result we're getting from Nobu and Soho blocking up the streets, this is a project for you. Uh, Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, environmental review, I agree with who I think Pat Healy and, and Joe Drummond, uh, th there should be an environmental review. This, look, the water's coming down on Westward Beach Road, it's going into the stream and the stream is dumping into the, the ocean in a protected environment. Uh, I, I think that's what our mission statement and general plan says. We're supposed to be protecting the environment and doing what we can to make sure we're doing that. So I think an environmental review is right in line with this thing. The computation for, for service area, uh, and, and Adrian is correct. When I looked at the document, I found out that some of the, you know, they, they have the um, amount of service area. Then when I sort of blew the picture up and took a look, I saw there were areas that were service areas that were not included in the computation. And the computation is important because it, it defines how many parking spaces you have to have. And I think the interesting part everybody should realize in this, the city does not have a consistent definition of service area. I've gone, when I was on the planning commission, we did lilies up at Point Doom. Uh, I can't remember. And the, de the definitions of what is service area are different. And you would think I'm making it up, but I confirmed that with Adrian when I was talking to him. And basically what it looks like, what they do is figure out how many parking spaces they have and then define service area to match up with those parking spaces. 
All right, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's right either. Uh, this project on page 21 of the staff report, this project says there's dealing with the, the 0.15 slope problem. Uh, they're gonna have a, a comprehensive site maintenance and reporting process. Now, when we did the house up in uh, Inland Lane over on Big Rock, they had the same requirement. But the requirements for doing that comprehensive study and the reports were built into the resolution. So everybody knew what had to be done. There was a way to track it. And we were sure, in fact, if that was going on, it was going to be done. In this case, those requirements are included in the geotechnical report someplace, which is going to get buried in this file cabinet and it never be done. So they should be included in, this, in the resolution where everybody can see them, because that's going to be the controlling document on this, on this uh, project. The assumption of risk this project is going to have to sign. I asked Adrian to please send me a copy of the assumption of risk. I want to see what it said. And what he sent me was an assumption of risk document, but it was for a house, not for a hotel. And what I wanted to see was inside this document, how are they going to treat the hotel guest and the, and the guest in the restaurant? I mean, are they going to tell them about the fact that there's a problem? Uh, if they're not going to tell about the fact that there's a problem, does that place the city at some responsibility that we've approved the project, it is in a risky area, we've made no, no effort to try and inform the people who are coming there that there's a potential danger? I, I don't know. The, those are... Those are questions above my pay grade, but I wanted to see that document to see exactly what the city was going to do, how we were going to deal with that. I agree with the fire stairway issue. I think that's you know, unbelievable. Uh, some of the requirements that Adrian has put into the project to deal with, you know, no lights up on the top deck nobody is allowed in the pool unless they live in or they, they stay in the hotel um those are good let me go back a step in the last finance administrative finance committee meeting i get chastised because on some of the dark sky stuff that we city council passed the staff is now having a problem getting all that stuff implemented and the comment i got and i'm paraphrasing it said geez if you guys had known you know the, the work we got to go through you might have done some different stuff and i took that to heart so now i'm saying okay if, if i'm going to approve something i want to make sure staff has got a way to make sure they can imp implement it so when you look at these things you know there's no food on the top allowed by the pool except there's a bar right next to it where people are going to be eating and, and getting stuff to drink that doesn't make any sense you, you only people allowed by the pool or people in the hotel how are they going to enforce that there is no enforcement for that uh, how are you going to keep the employees in the hotel from parking on from prevent them from parking on Westward Beach Road, which would then get us in, into a fight with the Coastal Commission, uh, as opposed to parking on site? There's no other way to enforce any of this stuff. Uh, so that you know, if if you're going to pass the law, if you're going to make those resolutions and make those conditions, staff also has to give us some level of confidence that in fact they're going to be able to enforce this stuff and make it work. Uh, I got other stuff, but that, that's enough for now. I got more. Let's see if everybody else has to say. I'll come back later on. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Bruce? Let me put my hand down. Okay. So, you know, we have here what I call a dog's breakfast of applications designed to permit the applicant to have a hotel on property that's not zoned for that use and to excuse various historical and ongoing violations of Malibu law resulting from unpermitted expansions of at least one structure, unpermitted reduction in parking capacity, and other issues. And rather than require the property owner bring the structures and operations into compliance with the applicable law and cure the historical and ongoing violations of law, the proposal is to change the law to make the legal, the legal violations lawful. Uh, to me, that's a diametric opposite of what we should be doing, and it sets a terrible precedent. Consider this analogy. The owner of a large house on Carbon Beach decides to use the house as a bed and breakfast. They build an unpermitted deck on the roof of the house with a bar for serving alcohol to the paying guests. And the, okay, the way to bring that property into compliance is order them to cease and desist from the illegal use of the property 
order them to remove the deck, impose and collect appropriate fines. The appropriate response is not to rezone the parcel to accommodate a bed and breakfast, retroactively permit the rooftop deck, amend the applicable code to exempt provision of alcohol to paying guests of a bed and breakfast, and forgive any prior citations. To me, that's absurd. Now, I'm going to get into the specific things that are being requested, but let's make some comments about some of the things people said already. There are nine discretionary requests. Uh, and, and first of all, you don't, I, I don't believe we should reward violations with grants of, specific, of discretionary requests. It, 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 I'm not saying it's an absolute rule that that would never happen, but we ought to be doing that only where there's a clear benefit to Malibu and its residents from doing so. And by the way, we have, a, we have a very quaint rural motel here and a very quaint little restaurant if it weren't illegally expanded. And that fits with the vision and mission of Malibu. The property owner, it's been said, the property owners don't have rights to the variances. I'm sorry, they have a right to request variances. Everyone has that right. You can request anything you want. And the staff should not, I agree with this, should not prevent anyone from presenting a request for a variance if they think they're entitled to a variance. But discretionary requests and variances, they're not discretionary to the staff. They're discretionary to us. We make the decision as to whether the variance requirements are satisfied. We make the decision as to whether we wanna exercise our discretion where we have it in favor of granting a request. The staff should be presenting the facts. Applicant wants A, B, and C. Here are the facts. Not, we believe they should get this discretionary application granted because that's not the staff's job. Now, I don't fault the staff for doing that. And, and you know, Richard, Yolanda, Adrian and, and everyone else, they're, they're doing the best they can. I don't believe they were given the right instructions historically as to what their response, what their role is. They understand the code. They understand the rules. They understand what's required to satisfy the rules, but it's not their job when things have to be approved by a different body. This isn't a plan. This isn't something being approved at the planning desk. It's not their job to decide what we should do. It's their job to give us the information from which we can make that decision. And it would make their job a lot easier actually, if they had been trained in that manner so that they don't have to be put here being told by residents they're making the wrong decisions and they're advocating for the wrong results because they shouldn't have to be advocating for anything. They should just be presenting the facts matter of factly and having us decide that. And that's not a criticism of the staff. I'm, I'm trying to actually make their job easier by saying that. So turning to the specific requests that are made that are for us to decide, not for the staff to decide. So I, I, I'm going to put aside the recommendations. I'm just going to focus on what are the facts. Rezoning. As I understand matters, rezoning is being proposed by the staff, and I get this, because they believe, and, and, and again, rezoning is not for the staff to do or to, or to even recommend. What they, they do is they say, in our opinion, this needs to be rezoned for this to work. So here's the facts that would support a rezoning if you choose to do it. Rezoning is being proposed because the staff believes, rightly or wrongly, that CV1 doesn't support the development and operation of a motel and a separate standalone restaurant on the same parcel, which is what we have here. If, the par if there were two parcels here right next to each other, exactly the full size of, the, of this one, but it were divided in some way. There's, there'd be no problem under CV1 with building this quaint little motel. There'd be no problem under CV1 on the other property building this quaint little restaurant before it was illegally expanded. And there'd be no issue here. The problem the staff perceives is that because there's a, a motel and a restaurant on the same parcel, in effect, that's a, that's a hotel. And the owner of the property doesn't agree with that. The owner of the property says, no, I've got a property with two different uses on it, a motel and a restaurant. I'm not sure what the right answer to that is. That's one of those examples I was talking about earlier where our law is not entirely clear and we actually have some flexibility in interpreting it. 
we could say that if a property is large enough to support a motel and a standalone restaurant, and they are otherwise com um, compliant with all the law, they have the, they're the right distance from each other, they each have the right parking, they otherwise comply with the building codes and everything else, that's fine. That's not a hotel. That's just somebody that's using a large property for two different uses. But if that's not allowed, this is improper here. Okay, so it's unclear to me whether the staff's right or wrong about that. If they're correct, however, then there's no need to rezone this. I mean, I'm sorry, if they're incorrect, there's no need to rezone this property at all. They've got a, they got a motel. They've had the motel forever. They've got a restaurant. They've had the restaurant forever. And if you can have those two uses, we're fine. We're done with the rezoning question. But if the staff's correct, we have an unlawful, we have, we have a, a, a lawfully permitted non-conforming use of this property. The property is being used for a motel and a restaurant, even though it's not allowed to be under our existing law. Bruce, you're getting echoey. Okay. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I put my notes on top of the speaker. Apologize for that. Ah. Okay. It happened once before. All right. So I oppose the rezoning for the following reasons. I have five separate reasons. One, it's not necessary if the law permits a motel and a separate restaurant. It's just, it's just an unnecessary act. And that's a question that I think we can address down the line, perhaps through Zoraisis, get some specific determination on that. Can a property have a motel, a CD1, have a motel and a restaurant? Not connected, not built in the same property, not in the same building, but separate operations, just like it could if they were two next door to each other. All right, second, rezoning of the property doesn't fit with the general plan, pursuant to which the property already was properly zoned CV1, when a comprehensive study and analysis was performed as to what the zones should be. So it doesn't fit with our, with our general plan. It's, it should be CV1, not CV2, and we shouldn't change it just to accommodate the structures that are on it. Third, if the operation of a motel and a restaurant on the property is unlawful, Rezoning it would reward historical and ongoing violations of the law with retroactive forgiveness and prospective permission. Shouldn't do that. Either it's either legal or it's not legal, but that's not our issue. We didn't make it illegal. It either was done wrong or it was done right. If it was done right, it doesn't need to be rezoned. If it was done wrong, you don't reward the wrongful action with a rezoning. Fourth, and this was mentioned by a number of the residents, rezoning would permit future development of a true hotel with an integrated restaurant, meeting rooms, and other amenities offered by hotels that are not permitted for a motel. So if we change this to a hotel zone, and, and, and who knows who else is going to ask for that down the line, we're, we're opening the floodgate to who knows what down the line by this owner or by a different owner. Lastly, rezoning would establish a bad precedent in general other parcels will want to be rezoned as hotels if they only have currently motels and non-conforming uses. People who own a property with a non-conforming use will want to be rezoned to eliminate the non-conforming aspect of the impermissible use. They'll say, look, you did it for them, do it for us. And I understand there's already an application coming down the pike by the Nobu motel, I think it is, to be able to have similar benefits. So it's not like this is an abstract concern. All right, so, now, so I, don't, I don't think we should be rezoning this. If there are non-conforming structures or uses on the property that were not lawfully permitted prior to their construction or use, they're just illegal. They need to be brought into conformity with the existing law. The, the, the pitch by the owner was all of my non-conforming structures and uses were lawfully permitted. Maybe they were maybe they weren't. If they weren't lawfully permitted, the, the owner's entire argument sinks because the argument was based on our code allowing the per legally permitted historically non-conforming structures and uses to continue. Our code does not allow non-conforming non uses and structures that weren't lawfully permitted. But the, So the owner says they were lawfully permitted. I don't know if they were or they weren't. But if they were lawfully permitted, as the owner has said, then they're fine. They can continue with their lawfully permitted non-conforming use and their lawfully permitted non-conforming structure. 
subject to the structure that is not only non-conforming, but also illegally expanded, needing to be brought back into the proper size. Now, if an application is made to repair or improve a non-conforming structure that was lawfully permitted, that can occur pursuant to Municipal Code 17.60.020. That was mentioned by the owner also. That was something that came up after the Woolsey fire. We, we changed the law to say that if you've got a lawfully permitted, there was a permit under old law, structure or use that's now non-conforming, we're going to treat it for purposes of maintaining it or improving it as if it's permit as if it's conforming you can you can improve it you can keep it what you can't do is tear it down and replace it i th i think that was a mistake instead i don't know if it was intentional or unintentional but the statement by the owner that they have the right to tear it down under that code section because it's old that's and, and then replace it with another non-conforming structure and non-conforming use. I think that's flat out wrong. And if I'm wrong about that, I'll, I'll ask the staff to correct me. But my understanding is that the exception there is if it's destroyed like by a fire or an earthquake or a flood, something outside the control of the owner. So just because you let your property fall into disrepair by not maintaining it, that's not natural causes. That's not outside your control. You don't get to then tear down your non-conforming structure and retain the right to rebuild it. You lose your, non, your, your right to retain non-conformity at that point. So there's a lot going on here. Um, last, the applicant says, okay, I'll move on next one. If variances are required and warranted with respect to otherwise permissible repairs or improvements to a non-conforming structure that was lawfully permitted, then the variances should be granted, but they should be limited to the repair or improvement, not to a new development. So you've got a motel. If the motel, and, and, and actually the motel is perfectly fine. My understanding is the motel is a permitted use. It's a permitted structure. You got a restaurant. Maybe the restaurant is a um, non-conforming use because it shouldn't be on the same property with the motel, or maybe it's okay. But in any event, they, if they need to make some repairs to the part of the restaurant that was permitted, not the part they illegally expanded, and I don't care if it wasn't the owner, the owner is responsible for the property. If they wanna make repairs or improvements, and improvements I understand means less than 50% of the structure is being fixed. That's okay if they need a variance in my mind, as long as they otherwise are entitled to the variance, but the variance doesn't go beyond that to give them a whole new structure that's different than the one that's there. And, and by the way, they're mixing and matching, like the parking example. Um, the statement was made that they're only required to have 40 spaces, but if they have a hotel, my understanding is they're required to have many more spaces. So, and I, and I heard the applicant say, I don't want a hotel. I, I really just want to keep my motel and my restaurant. And I say, actually, fine, keep your motel and your restaurant. But if they get a hotel, if they get a rezoning and this is called a hotel, then they're not in the legal number of spaces because hotels require more spaces. And they're not proposing to come into conformity with the number of spaces required by a hotel. They wanna still look at the number of spaces they would have needed for their motel and for their restaurant, but get the benefit of a hotel and then maybe expand other things. It, it, it's, it's an apples and oranges thing. All right, lastly, if the applicant still desires the proposed lot line adjustment, I have no objection to that. If they want to acquire some property that they need to make their deck lawful, as long as they're entitled to have that deck, um, and they need that additional space rezoned CV1, not CV2, and that's not the application before us, I, don't, I, I tend to think I would have no problem with that. Again, subject to them curing the historical and ongoing violations, and payment of appropriate fines. And by the way, I don't understand the statement that code enforcement fees have been paid based on an investigation. So in other words, they should be fined, but since they paid us to look into what they might be able to do to be allowed to have this property, that's satisfied. I think they have to pay for that anyway. I don't get why that constitutes a payment of a fine. Um, lastly on this, without regard to whether the property is left as is or a new project of some sort is proposed, again, I, I think the existing violations 
need to be cured. And if there are fines, they need to be levied. Now, actually, I, I said lastly, I don't one more thing. You said if, lastly three I, times so far. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't have said it at all then. Um, if a majority of city council is nonetheless inclined to permit the property to be rezoned, and I'm, I'm going to vote against that, an environmental impact study should be required to assess the cumulative impact of similar requests throughout the city. If the owner needs or desires to tear down and rebuild any non-conforming structure because it's in disrepair um, or cease any non-conforming use because it was not lawfully permitted, I would be willing to consider the subdivision of the parcel into two separate parcels if that's something that can be done so that then they're perfectly fine. They've got their motel, they've got their restaurant, they're on two separate parcels. It doesn't create a bad precedent. And they have exactly what they say is all they really wanted from day one. Again, with the smaller restaurant, unless they then make a proper application to expand the restaurant if, it, if the property will fit it. And that can be decided on its own merit when that application is presented. Um, or I would have no problem if it can be done legally and I would need advice from the city's attorneys or the city staff, I would be okay with actually making a one-time decision to say, even though it's impermissible to have a motel and a restaurant together on the same parcel, because this motel and restaurant have been together on this same parcel for all of these years, this one property is going to be allowed to continue to do that. But that avoids calling it a ho changing the zone to a hotel zone so that someone in the future or even this owner in the future might take advantage of that new zoning and do something dramatically different. Again, subject to curing any historical and ongoing violations and payment of appropriate fine. Bottom line, I don't support the project for all the reasons I've now explained and for which many of the residents have spoken up. I do want to find a way to let this property owner keep what they've always had, a quaint motel and a quaint little restaurant in, the, in this rural zone. But if that can't be done, you know, that's unfortunate. I'd like to see us get there, but this goes way above and beyond anything that we ought to be considering to be permitted and it sets all kinds of bad precedent. Thank you, Bruce. Mikey? That was a lot, Bruce. <laughs> I was taking notes, but it was hard to absorb it all, but uh, well done, I guess. <laughs> um, I have a lot of notes too, but I'm going to try and pick through them as uh, Steve and Bruce have really picked through a lot of things. First of all, I want to thank a couple of the letter writers for really helping zero in on this project. And that would be Sal and Barbara Fish for the email that many people copied the really detailed things, and uh, and Lynn's email. It's nice to have a couple of people really detail what their you know their their concerns and what they're trying to do. So I, I do appreciate that, that actually. Uh, those are two emails I kept coming back to. Um, I just want to hit a couple of points here. First of all, with I, I'm assuming. I guess this is for probably Adrian or Richard. I'm assuming even with the increase in the size of the restaurant being fairly minor, that no traffic study was required. So a traffic study was not required for the project because um, they're not changing the service area uh, except for uh, they're going from 900 and uh, 948 uh, serve, uh, square feet of service area to 996. Uh, so uh, about a 48 square foot uh, increase. Um, however, that so that's one additional parking spaces per our code. And so uh, the building is getting bigger, but the way we calculate parking uh, pursuant to the parking regulations is uh, based on uh, number of rooms, based on employees uh, for the um, motel or, or hotel. Um, and then also for the restaurant, uh, it's based on service area. And so as those things didn't change, they are not, for our code, they're not generating an additional increase in parking demand. And therefore a traffic study was not warranted for this project. Okay, thank you. Um, 
with the request to put on a rooftop deck and um, obviously maybe following that a lot of complaints about past sound issues so this, was a sound study ever considered so the reason why we were very conservative in our conditions is that there was not a track uh, there was not a uh, noise study uh, prepared for the property so instead we uh, added conditions requiring that again the restaurant closes at 10 um, that they um, don't use the rooftop deck uh, after dark and uh, no amplified music is used, which is a condition uh, the planning commission added to the project. Okay. And just to clarify, and first of all, I, Bill Sampson, thank you. I had, as an avid user of our trails on a multiple times a week time or basis, I had never heard of the market trail. Um, so I was excited to hear about it and try and figure out if it exists, because if so, I want to be on it. Um, but if the market trail is found to actually exist or exist in the future, did I hear you say that there would be room for it to operate anyhow? Uh, yeah, so the trail as shown on the map, and again, this map um, shows where a potential trail could go. So whether the trail is there or not is, is, is hard to know. Um, but it shows it to be in line with the Southern property. Um, and so, um, and it doesn't come anywhere close to the existing development as there is a slope between the existing development area and the property line. Uh, so the trail seems to be at the very top of um, the slope uh, before it plateaus uh, for the uh, mobile home units are at the top of, of that slope. Um, so it doesn't seem like it would conflict uh, with the use of that trail, uh, current or future uh, use of that trail. Um, and if there is a public trail there, um, the, the LCP uh, does require that we do an assessment of visual impacts. Right. And, um, you know, as, you're, as you would be at a much higher elevation looking down at the property, uh, the proposed building is not going to obstruct uh, any impressive scenes. It might obstruct some views of the road or some views of further landscaping, um, but it is not expected to obstruct any view. So um, I think that would be like the only concern if there was in fact a trail. And again, I looked at the survey for the property and I, I looked at any other maps to see if that trail shows up anywhere and I couldn't see it. So uh, currently I don't have any evidence that there's a public trail that the public can go ahead and use. Understood, but uh, interesting that it was there historically, and I, I don't know the reality of it, but very interesting. Um, and I have to apologize because this is in there, but it was with all the speakers and and uh, counselors' comments, it just it's left my head. What what is currently what size restaurant is currently permitted? So um, without violations, act actually completely commit um, permitted. Yeah. So the only thing is, that we were able to confirm is that there was a 954 square foot uh, building, and, and that was based on that 1996 approval. And the existing square footage um, shown on the plans that were provided to us shows that the building is. Um, about 1,150 square foot uh, bigger than that. So about, about just over 2,000 square feet total in square footage. Okay. So a double in size um, without the benefit of permit. Understood. Um, This is probably an outlier, but something I noticed. Um, this project um, is asking to take property that's in zoned mobile home and change it to a different zoning. It just occurred to me because we just went through it that our housing assessment needs report, one of the parts of it is not to diminish the amount of 
mobile home zoning in the city. Uh, now, I know it's probably an outlier as it's on a side of a hill, but that was notable to me. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I, I don't, and, and you're right, this is a hillside. So I, uh, I think there's expectation that, you know, uh, this probably won't be used for, you know, future units. Um, and the area we're talking about is about half an acre of a, a much larger parcel. Um, they did have uh, an email provided to them by HCD that uh, basically said that they don't they don't need their approval for this, and they have the owner's permission to purchase the land from them. Yeah, I was more yeah I knew that I was more thinking about city policy, but I know I know we're in a bit of an outlier here. But it was just noticed it because we just went through reading that giant um, housing needs assessment report. Um, what, if it's known, is the factor of safety at the property now? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the number uh, offhand, but it looks from what Lynn said, it, it was somewhere around uh, 1.25, I think is the number he gave us. Well, that's what they that's that's the that's what the target is with the new development what's it currently at? no the requirement is 1.5 so the the code requires a 1.5 factor of safety um and then a pseudostatic 1.1 factor of safety so this 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 is 1.25 which doesn't meet the the 1.5 and the casings they want to put in for this project don't improve it the casings won't improve the factor of safety, unfortunately. It would give stability to the building, um, but the areas that's unstable is the areas around the building itself, uh, which uh, it would take a lot uh, for them to stabilize. And, you know, the, it looks like the slope uh, massing and maybe Lauren can can weigh in on this, uh, I believe is, is likely larger than the lot itself. So um, so I'm not sure if they're able to feasibly um, be able to bring the factor of safety to meet our code. Okay. I see Lauren popping up there. Did you have a comment you wanted to make on that, Lauren? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Lauren. Oh, probably because there she... we go. Thank okay. you. Um, uh, uh, unlike the planning commission meetings where I have control of my mute button, I don't hear. Um, uh, so I did want to say that Adrian was correct in that um, there are two because I, I just finished re reviewing this um, after Yolanda called me into the meeting. Um, the overall slope stability that is a slightly above 1.25 is static slope stability and that is for the entire slope that the restaurant sits on and it extends beyond the property um the uh both the static and the pseudo static slope stability do not meet current requirements for new projects um this was presented to us as a remodel um as yolanda accurately said the um we did require them to do local slope stability for the wedge of slope that's immediately below the restaurant where the deck would be extended and and that did meet static um slope stability i can't recall what this what the seismic was but th that was above 1.5 and yes the piles would improve the, the slope stability for the wedge um of below the restaurant, but not the overall slope that the restaurant sits on on that entire hillside. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to just make this quick. So much has been said already. I don't need to repeat a lot of the other things, but here's, here's the positive things if some version of this project's done. Project will make the uh, It'll make this property dark sky compliant. I like that. Um, there's no grading needed. I like that. Uh, factor of safety 
is not unimproved. It's theoretically a little bit improved. Um, it's ADA compliant. There's better fire department access. So those are good things. I, at this point, you know, I'll listen to everyone else, but I struggle from doubling plus the size of the restaurant. Um, I don't know how it's warranted. I see that a remodel is perfectly in order here on this motel. I struggle on the zone change um, from moment one. I just, I, this is, you know, a legal non-conforming project basically with some exceptions in there. And yeah, I think it's a cute little 16 room motel. I spent a lot of time at that restaurant, um, particularly discussing the dark sky initiative years ago when I was a planning commissioner. Um, it's, I don't know why that's why we, where we ate, um, I am all in favor of the remodel and the benefits to the owner and the benefits to the community and making it safer and all the other positive things I just said, dark sky, um, fire safety, ADA, et cetera, all of that. But right now, and at this point, I um, would not know how to vote to change the zoning. And I would not know how to vote to increase the size of the restaurant at this point, uh, based on what I've heard. And those are my comments for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Thanks, Paul. Uh, as Mikey said, so much has been said about this, and there's no need to repeat it. Uh, but I want to also acknowledge Victoria Hand for emailing us today. Uh, she lives in the Point Doom Club right above the restaurant. And um, that was the only person I heard from in the Point Doom Club. But I, I, uh, I appreciate her concern about the noise uh, and selfish. The same for you and your neighbors. I, it seems to me we've got to kick through this whole garden variety of, of requests being made of us and decide what we can live with and what we can't. Um, and I just want to um, make sure with either Adrian or Richard, uh, the, fees, the fees will be or have been collected on this unpermitted work or in order for it to be brought into conformance. That will be the case. I'd be glad to address that. Actually, I was going to bring that up at the end after all the council members, but the 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 planning department doesn't have um, a fine, a punitive action, is what the city attorney's office had, had spoken to us about. We we don't uh, go out and just have a, a set amount that we can just collect for a violation other than obviously an administrative citation. So what functions as a fine, this is coming from our code enforcement manager, is that we have on code enforcement cases a, a standard two-hour investigation fee for code enforcement staff. And then any additional work they do beyond that, we bill hourly. And so the planning department's fine is what they call it, our, our folks, because we have to justify that we're doing some sort of work and we're not just collecting money without doing work. Uh, so essentially there, there was a, a, about a little over $800 worth of staff time put into this by our code enforcement staff. And they've had to pay that fee. Now, the other aspect of this is that when they get to the building and safety uh, permitting phase, the building official could, if there's any need for additional work on their end, they could also have the ability to essentially double the, the building permitting cost. I just want to be clear about that, not the, the planning permit, but the building permits. Uh, so that is the, the code enforcement um, fining or, 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 or fees collection uh, that, that's taken place so far. So I do know, I did confirm this afternoon that they had paid uh, the monies uh, that were um, a, a bill essentially from our code enforcement staff. Uh, and then, like I said, the next part would be if there's any work that building and safety has to do beyond their usual work, they would be able to collect for that. Okay, thank you, Richard. I think that issue should be revisited. 
and I don't think I'm going to see much disagreement from the rest of the council. Um, that's that's sort of an invitation to uh, ask for forgiveness after the fact. So um, that let's just make note of that. Um, yeah, as Mikey said, this this would uh, cover dark skies uh, compliance. Um, the fact that the deck is not to be used after dusk, no amplified uh, sound or music. Um, those are all good things. I too am hoping that uh, the, the zoning change is not necessary. Um, and I think if it, if it allows, I, this is a very challenging site, but if this, if this allow, if this zoning change allows uh, the possibility of uh, an expanded hotel or, or even just uh, somebody else on another property using this as a precedent that I'm sure that's not something we want to do. So what I'm wondering with uh, about here is picking through the long list of items uh, on this project and uh, Bruce, you picked through them pretty carefully there. Um, I'm wondering if you can put together a motion. Well, if, if I may, um, I, don't I don't think- I don't get a chance. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul, Never mind. Anyway, I will stop for the I'll moment. I'll come back to it, Karen. Paul, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, what I was gonna suggest is that uh, we do a, a series of, of uh, just quick hand raises about, I, I think no amplified music, everybody is willing to haze, raise their hand is something they're in favor of, right? I'm, I'm seeing head nods. I, are, is, that, is, is that everybody? No, you're not in favor of no amplified music. I'm Bruce is in favor of amplified music. No. I'm in favor of amplified, but they can get have amplified music if they get a temporary use permit. And you can't let them do that. I, I think we've we've heard long long and uh, I've heard a lot from the Bonsell neighborhood about the need to not have amplified music because it flows across the highway and and goes in it. And Bruce, I didn't interrupt you when you were talking. That's fine. Okay. So. So that's maybe a four or maybe three out of five are in favor of no amplified music. Uh, I think we're all, I can't imagine anybody is not in favor of them uh, doing what the fire department wants doing to increase their access to the property by putting the, the fence, the, the walkway in, correct? No, not in favor of putting the walkway in, all right? Could, could I just ask a question about that? Sure. I don't mean to interrupt you, Paul, but that's okay. It did occur to me, and I'm sure many other people, how did the fire department sign off on this when our fire rebuilds are being required to have a turnaround? They have. And that's a question for the fire department. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Hecox answered that question that they, uh, they apparently have a standard of driving in and backing out 100 feet. I heard that. Okay. Thank you. So, and and the other thing we have to remember here is we're we're dealing with a motel and a restaurant. The original ones were built in the fifties, which is seventy five years ago, and that's they're part of the rural character that was referred to in our general plan. And uh, so, I'm not in favor of there not being a, a motel and a restaurant there. Uh, and uh, I think everybody would probably be in favor of requiring them to filter any runoff from the site. Okay. So, and where we differ or where we have things to discuss is what do we do about the fact that there is a restaurant that was expanded without benefit of permit? And uh, what do we want them to do? We, if we ask them to tear it down, which apparently has already been asked, they've said, how about if we replace it with something that's properly engineered and has a good foundation 
and is ADA compliant? And that's the question before us, as I understand it, basically. Is that correct, Mr. Malika? Yes, they are. That that's what they want to do. It's and okay. The the scope of the remodel. Um, I, I just want to be clear so everyone understands that yeah, what's going on here is that given the scope of how extensive the remodel is, uh, it. it it says Bruce mentioned, or sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Councilmember Silverstein. It, it's as much as he mentioned, they are losing their nonconformities. Uh, this this is going to be a new building just because right. of how far they're going. All right. And I think that nobody wants to see it uh, changed, the zoning changed from C1 to C2. And that's, that's uh, you know, I don't, uh, the the hotel zoning was was created for mostly for buildings that have meeting rooms and ballrooms and that kind of stuff. There's never gonna be room for it here. It's not, uh, and the slopes would, would uh, rule it out. And then the other thing is that uh, I'm, I like the idea of, fixing their violation of going over the property line by buying more property. And it, it's not land that's usable for putting mobile homes on, or believe me, the uh, owners of the property would not be willing to sell it. So those are my thoughts and Bruce. Well, if Richard has some comments, I see his hands up. I, I'm happy to hear them before I speak. Richard. Thank you very much, council members and mayor. I to kind of, uh, I think I understand where you might be going with this, and then also uh, perhaps uh, one uh, some of the comments that have come up tonight. If there is an appetite that we allow for essentially the, these two separate buildings, uh, two separate uses to be in, in this existing zoning district, uh, the boy the parcel zone, we we don't necessarily have to go to uh, zoo races to have a policy. What we could do is bring a policy directly, uh, we can get some guidance from the council and bring a policy directly back to this council. Uh, and the council could essentially memorialize uh, through that policy, we can, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, I just, all I asked for from the council on this is to put some boundaries on this. I would prefer not to be left with a, a situation where folks are uh, some of the other motels in the city come to us and try to find some way to now get a restaurant on their property. Um, so I just want to do something here that we all can agree so that there is a uh, some good direction on this and we follow the council's wishes. Am, am I correct that the the restaurant, it seems to me that the restaurant has been there, there has been a restaurant there and was one when I moved here 43 years ago. I don't know if I'm correct or not, but that's what it seems like to me. So. Uh, Adrian, uh, could you confirm with the permitting history? Yeah, unfortunately we weren't able to confirm uh, how long the restaurant and, <laughs> um, and that's because uh, the permits that we have, uh, one permit, the very original permits was one for motel and the other one was for an apartment and uh, a garage. And so at some point, um, either, you know, one of those buildings was uh, converted or uh, there is a permit that we can't find for uh, for the restaurant itself. But what we do know is, uh, and so we, when we talk about, you know, legally established, uh, we're talking about the fact that it's a building that's been there since before cityhood and uh, that we have aerial photos that show it from a very long time ago. Uh, but we can't confirm exactly when it was constructed. We believe right. it was in the 50s. And uh, we do believe, it, based on the age of uh, the state it's in, um, again, that it was in the 50s and it was probably constructed at the same time the rest of the uh, motel buildings were constructed. And the city of Malibu had a policy when we became a city that we were going to grandfather everything that existed as of that date. And I know the city flew the uh, community at that time to put a peg in the ground, so to speak, about 
what was pre-existing. Bruce? Okay. So first of all, I, I, I would like to suggest that we not use the term grandfather. There are some racial undertones to the history of how that came into play from the Civil War. Um, it, 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 we agreed to retroactively authorize those things. Um, I don't think that's entirely correct, though, either, because based on my conversations with Adrian and Richard and others, I understand that we did allow non-conforming structures to continue, but not non-conforming uses. There was a time after which the uses were supposed to be cleaned up if they were non-conforming. And therefore, if this parcel should not have both a motel and a restaurant, it's not a it's not even a lawful non-conforming use anymore because it was supposed to have ceased. But I'm willing to actually personally, I'd like I'd like to try to find a way to forgive that. Um here are my comments. One, it's not our I don't believe it's our job to redline the application and to pick and choose what we like and what we don't like. This is the the, the applicant is the master of their application. They presented an application that, among other things, requires a zoning change that we're not inclined to grant them. And we're done. If I mean, if, if, if we take a vote and we're not inclined to grant the zoning change, we're done because the application before us requires it. So they need to go back to the drawing board, unfortunately. And it's, and it's not our fault. It's because they've got this convoluted dog's breakfast of an application. Um, it may be that they don't need a zoning change. I don't think we should make that decision on the fly. I, I, you know, I appreciate Richard's require, request for um, guidance on that. I think that that's a very complex question that needs to be answered by, among other things, looking at all of the other properties in town that might end up trying to use a motel and a restaurant on two parts of one parcel and find out what the consequences would be of that interpretation versus the staff's current interpretation, which that is that this is a hotel. Um, if this is illegal, it's illegal. Again, it's not our fault it's illegal. Um, it just is what it is. We should be trying to find a way, though, to let them keep their 900-foot restaurant and their motel, which is what they had legally or illegally as of 1995. Um, the dark sky issue, I mean, I, Karen and Mikey, I agree with you, but, you know, by the time they ever get around to doing this, they're going to have to comply with the dark sky laws anyway. They're coming into place in 10 months. So it it, that's not a benefit of this project because this project won't come into play until after they'd have to be dark sky compliant anyway. The fines. Um, administrative citations are not meaningless, and this is a misdemeanor. My understanding is that any violation of our code is a misdemeanor. So I, I, it's not correct that we don't have the ability to fine somebody who's a scofflaw. Um, they've been doing this for years in violation of our law. It's time that we put our foot down and if we have, I mean, either do it administratively or if we have to go to court, go to court. But you don't just say we don't have the ability to um, impose fines through the planning department. That may be correct, but the city certainly has the ability to impose fines or obtain fines. And as Karen said, it's just, it's just an invitation to do the wrong thing if all we're doing is saying after years of nonconformance and illegal expansions, you got to pay $800 for us to investigate what's necessary for you to fix it. Um, again, I, I don't see how we can approve anything tonight. I mean, we can, we can we can create all kinds of convoluted motions, but the bottom line is this project doesn't doesn't put, and we should just say no, and then let some in, let some subordinate groups make those decisions going forward. Because otherwise, if every time somebody comes to us and wants to start redoing their whole project, and, and we're not supposed to negotiate it over what the project should be. The project was given to us. We either agree with it or we disagree with it. Sometimes you can knock a piece out and not change it dramatically, but that, this isn't that case. This is a very complicated, nine different discretionary requirements, variances, zoning changes. I think we just say no. So I'm, I'm gonna make a motion that we reject the um, project and send it back to whatever they can do next. I'll second that motion. You, your motion right. and a second. You're right, Bruce. We're not. Our job is not to redesign projects. A motion and a second. Any other discussion? Kelsey, will you take the roll? And just to clarify, that's directing staff to bring back a, a resolution to deny the project at a future meeting. Yes. Excellent. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Uring. Yes. Mayor Grisanti. Yes. Motion carries. 
And can I make okay. one one request? C could could we please receive a copy of the proposed resolution before it becomes a part of the agenda report? So that if we have comments, we don't need to then be criticizing what's been put before the public. We can work it out among our, you know, not among ourselves, but with the staff. And then what's before the council can be what we've already commented on. Can that be done? I think that's more of a question for the city attorney than for right. staff. I'm, ha I'm happy to share it with you in advance, Bruce. I think that'd probably be the best way to do it rather than give it to the full council and allow comments to be shared amongst the group. That would be inappropriate. I, I wasn't I'm happy to share it with you. I know you like Thank to review those. Thank you. Does anybody okay. have any objection to that? Because I don't want to do it if you do. No. Uh, that brings us to item 4B, approval of common community development block grant funds for fiscal year 2022-2023. Do we have a staff report? Yes, um, good evening, Mayor Grisanti and members of the City Council. The item before you now is to conduct a public hearing on the use of the City's Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG funds for fiscal year 2022-23. The City is estimated to receive um, $65,600 in CDBG funds for fiscal year 22-23. The actual amount the City will receive may vary slightly from this estimate. In addition, the city has an unallocated balance of CDBG funds from prior years. The city receives an allocation of federal CDBG funds every year, which are administered by the Los Angeles County Development Authority. The funding guidelines st stipulate that only 15% of the annual CDBG allocation can be allocated to public service programs, and that the remaining funds must be spent on eligible capital projects. In recent years, the Los Angeles Community Development Authority has at times allowed some cities to request to exceed this percentage threshold as long as the percentage threshold is maintained countywide. Historically, the city has awarded the maximum service program funds to the Malibu Community Labor Exchange to operate a day labor program to assist homeless and low income individuals and has had difficulty identifying CDBG eligible projects, um, excuse me, CDBG eligible capital projects. The Malibu Community Labor Exchange has long operated out of an office trailer on the county property on Civic Center Way. In January 2014, the Council adopted Resolution 1470, authorizing CDBG funds to be used to purchase and install a permanent office trailer for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange. At this time, it was determined that the Malibu Community Labor Exchange needed a new trailer because the existing trailer was dilapidated and would be unable to be relocated to accommodate the construction of the Santa Monica College Malibu Satellite Campus. Due to the delays in the construction schedule of the satellite campus, as well as the construction footprint, the permanent trailer was put on hold. Council subsequently authorized and approved the use of CDBG funds to cover the cost to rent an office trailer for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange during the construction of the satellite campus. Recently, representatives of Santa Monica College have informed the city that the satellite campus project is anticipated to be substantially complete in fall 2022. Given this timeline, staff is recommending the $98,000 in CDBG funds be used to fund the purchase and installation of a permanent trailer and 15,000 be allocated to Malibu Community Labor Exchange for operations. This recommendation is reflected in the proposed resolution before you tonight. And that concludes my report, um, but I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do we have any public comments? Hey, is Gabbard that... had signed up to speak on this item, but I don't see her in the meeting and I don't see any raised hands either. So that concludes public comments. Okay. Uh, council comments and discussion, Bruce. I have a question before I'll make any comments after hearing other questions, if there are any. Uh, Elizabeth, will if, if we don't use the $98,000 now, will it stay available for a future use that's appropriate under the CDBG rules? I would have to look at when exactly um, those funds were allocated. The guidelines do stipulate that they must be spent within three years of the initial allocation. So we don't know how long we still have to use them? I don't know how, we, how long we have for the entire amount. Um, what we have done um, in the past 
or once in the past, we had allocated funds to the CDBG revolving grant program so that other cities that may have a more immediate need for um, CDBG eligible projects could go forward. And then um, after a certain amount of time, we can re request our money back and would be repaid by those cities. And that, that has to happen. So it's the same thing as banking it? In, in yes, it's in, you could say that. Okay. That's my, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I see Steve's hand. Where's this, where is this new trailer going, Elizabeth? Um, the county and the, the Santa Monica College have um, indicated that it could be accommodated in the northwest corner of the property. Northwest. That's where the tow yard was, isn't it? Lisa, I think there's also a, a CNG station back there a long time ago and an oil roundup as yeah. well. Okay, I, I know where you are. Okay. That, it's behind the library. No, it's over on the side closer to uh, Stewart Ranch Road. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. If you take that driveway past the, what, the, the old building and went all the way past it, you would be in uh, the area that Elizabeth has described. Okay, got it. Back where the uh, inmates used to wash the, sh the sheriff cars back in the day when there was a sheriff station there. <laughs> and there were inmates. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just butt in with a quick question. Remind me, Elizabeth, I, I feel like, um, I mean, my brain's just going here, but typically it's common this time of night. Um, wasn't this part of the plan all along uh, with this college project was to, uh, we knew that that current facility was falling apart completely. And I, I believe we at some point talked about doing exactly what this stipulates tonight. Is, am, am I correct? This was always contemplated as part of those. Um as part of the construction um, and the city allocated CDBG funds um, through a public hearing in 2014. Um, but as I had mentioned earlier, you have three years to spend the money and um, we weren't able to move forward with the project within that time frame because of delays with the uh, construction of the satellite project. Okay, well, I know there's further speakers, but I'll just leave a motion to approve dangling there for anyone who wants to bite on it. Karen, I'm, I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah. No, I, I already asked some questions up. Karen wants to go. Karen, I'll wait. Um, I, I do remember, and anybody who's seen the trailer knows that um, the, the prospect of relocating it uh, had to be dropped because it looked like it wouldn't survive any kind of a move. It was so dilapidated. Um, and I just want to make sure it seems like we covered this, but maybe not completely. Do you know, Elizabeth, if any other CDBG eligible projects have been identified by the city? Um, we have never, the city has never, to my knowledge, used uh, CDBG funds for capital projects. We have used them for service programs. Um, and. Um, many years ago, the city actually was able to um, exchange funds, CDBG funds with other cities that had eligible capital projects um, for a certain percentage of, uh, of the dollar, but um, that, um, that was um, no longer allowed under the, the program guidelines um, quite some time ago. And so because of that, the city has accumulated unallocated balances um, and has given money to the re revolving fund um, or sometimes has had the ability to um, spend more on social programs, such as our um, PSPS generators for seniors and, um, and right. our uh, earthquake um, backpack kits. Right, right, right. I remember those. Okay. Okay. Um, there may be other discussion, but I will second Mikey's motion. Okay. I have a motion and a second, and Bruce has got his hand up to discuss. Yeah, okay, so, um, 
you know, I, I know that this trailer, this project once served a very valuable service in Malibu. Um, I don't know that it does or doesn't today. A number of residents have described it to me as it's basically now a place for unhoused people to hang out during the day, that no one is really going there and hiring anybody. I, I don't know whether that's accurate or inaccurate. I've got no personal experience. If that's the case, it's really not, if that were the case, it's not, it wouldn't be serving the purpose that it was intended. And, and I wouldn't view that as a beneficial purpose for the city. Um, if it truly is a place where, where people who are less fortunate can go and be hired as day laborers, which is what it was intended to be, that, that's great. That's a valuable service. Um, I'm inclined to support spending $15,000 to keep the operation in place for so long as we can figure out whether it really is valuable in the long term. Um, the 98,000 to me, one, if it's, if it's not a viable or valuable service, that's just money, good money being thrown after bad. But moreover, I'd rather the homelessness task force take a look at what better might be done with the $98,000, which would otherwise qualify as well for a CDBG grant, I would think. Um, they can consider even this in consider, in connection with other options. Um, I hadn't realized that we could use the money for things like generators for seniors. I mean, that's also, I think, that, that clearly to me is a more beneficial use for our residents than buying a trailer. I mean, if, if things like that can be done, I certainly more support using the money for that. So, um, you know, if, if you'll take a friendly amendment to approve the 15,000 and bank the 98 in the way that Elizabeth suggested, I'll make that friendly amendment. Otherwise, I'm gonna be inclined to vote against spending the money the way it's been proposed. I'm gonna I, ask. I think I need clarification on. Yeah, let's, I'll let Paul speak first. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna just ask is, is uh, Oscar still involved with the program, Elizabeth? I believe he is. There was some public comment today received from the um, community labor exchange um, representative. He, he used to give us a report, or he used to give the council a report uh, as to how many people had been hired and things like that. Is, is that something that uh, the city still gets or is, that all ceased for COVID? Um, it's my understanding that as, a, um, as required by their agreement with the city, the community labor exchange provides um, reports at certain intervals to the city um, regarding uh, clients served. I do see that I think Stephanie um, Cup is, has, has her hand raised. Um, I know that she is involved in the organization. If you have um, specific questions for them, she may be able to address them better than I can, but they certainly do need to report to the city um, regarding services provided. Okay. With permission of the rest of the council, I'd like to recognize Stephanie Cup in the hope she can answer the question. Hi, okay. uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Hi, sorry about that. I kept getting booted mm -hmm. out of the Zoom, so I was on YouTube. Um, yeah, so I'm the treasurer on the executive board of the labor exchange. And um, yeah, Kay Gabbard was supposed to be here, but I think this got to be so late that <laughs> she's probably in bed. Um, so yes, Oscar is still the director of the labor exchange. We are still very much in operation. Um, in answer to the question about um, us only serving homeless, I believe the numbers are usually between two and 5% of the workers that are hired each month are in the unhoused population, the remainder are, are not. So um, we are very much still in operation, very much uh, still in business, hiring people coming and, and hiring our workers. Um, we also partnered with the city of Malibu um, uh, and the um, uh, Malibu Foundation to do an emergency preparedness um program back in i think it was september but yeah it was september 11th 
so, you know, and, and so our workers, uh, several of whom were here during the Woolsey fire stayed the entire time, helped out homeowners. Um, so any other questions, I'm here to, to answer them. Okay, and I'm gonna just go on the record here and say I have hired people from the labor exchange, usually when uh, someone is moving or something like that. And uh, I've never written it off though, so the IRS can forget about it. Uh, Bruce. Well, I, I, I would like to understand what kind of numbers we're talking about, how many people in a given month are employed for how many hours at what wages, you know, how worthwhile is this endeavor? Um, and the, the other thing I'll note, and I, if, if you have an answer to that, Stephanie, it'd be great. If not, we, I would say defer the decision till we have that information. But the other thing is, I, I think if I remember correctly, the emergency preparedness thing was actually for unho unhoused people. I, it was not an emergency preparedness um, seminar thing in general for the residents. This one was specifically directed at the unhoused. I could be wrong about that, but. That's my understanding. Do you, I mean, it, it was not, it was it's specifically for day laborers and housekeeping type staff uh, that homeowners had. So it was not at, at, at all for um, the unhoused. Yeah. Okay, that's that's different than I had understood that. that thank you for that. Do you have rough numbers as to on a, in a given week or month, how many um, people are gainfully employed as a result of this project and like what kind of, what they do, what they make? I do, unfortunately, I'm trying to find the latest numbers and um, the latest I'm finding is like May, but um, so this was May of last year. We had, um, and, and this is pretty common. We've actually had a lot more jobs than this, I'm gonna say in recent months, but 978 jobs in the month of May um that represented um about 1400 1300 people that came to the labor exchange that month so 978 of them uh got jobs which was 73 percent of the people who came that's actually impressive who's who's hiring them malibu homeowners mostly um oscar would actually be a better person to answer you know the the number of people, but from my understanding, it's mostly Malibu homeowners, um, some businesses, um, they help every year at the, um, oh, chili cook off, you know, different events that are around town. Um, they get hired um, to help with that. Um, all kinds of things, but yeah, okay. I mean, Oscar, Oscar is our expert, um, but, uh, I've hired them. <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll, I'll revise what I said earlier, which is that I, I certainly support the 15,000 for now. And if three others are gonna vote for the 98, I'll join in for the sake of harmony. But I, personally, I would rather see more statistics before making a decision to spend that money. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yeah, I was just gonna suggest this, maybe if Oscar could get in front of us at some point in time, for the city and the city kind of let us know what's the numbers Bruce is looking for. I'd be interested in knowing that also. I mean, uh, if if this thing is producing a good result, we should we should fund it. Uh, but I'd sure like to hear more a little bit more about that before we. I, I'd like to hear more about that. I, I will join the group if they're going to vote tonight. But I'd like to see Oscar show up. Just let us know so you know we won't have to ask the questions again next year. I see Stephanie waving her hand again. Stephanie. Sorry, I got muted. Um, yeah, so I would love for that. We, we weren't alerted to this being on the agenda until this morning. So, um, uh, so uh, I know that he is here every year when we ask for um, the grant money that happens in the summer. Um, I'm not sure if he's traditionally been here for the CDBG um thing but um anyway I, I know that he is always very happy to answer questions and, and be here if needed thank you stephanie oh uh, can i just add one more thing i'm sorry sure um because 
I have been on the board for several years and, you know, when the whole SMC campus thing was going to be happening, um, there were promises made that that we would receive a trailer. Um, it was yeah. unclear to us at the time whether it was the county or the city, but I will throw that in there that um, this was a part of kind of our partnership with the city. Thank you, Stephanie. I see Mikey's hand. I was going to call the question, but Mikey. I just quickly, I, that's my recollection too, Stephanie. Um, I remember it was actually got kind of tense with the SMC as I remember at one point trying to resolve that. Um, I just wanted to give like Bruce a flavor. Generally, so at my age, one thing I learned with the labor exchange, I don't, I don't go often in COVID. I have not been, which is understandable. And I'll bet it's really hurt hurt them is honestly and i think uh yeah they went through some a little bit of tough times the the, the facility is very dilapidated too which doesn't help the amount of homeless hanging out in legacy park was an issue so this new location will be great um but if i know somebody who's moving i would go by there and get two to four guys and pick up a couple of pizzas and some drinks beers or sodas and go there and then they work, I pay them, that's my gift, and and donate the pizzas to everybody. And uh, the job gets done so much faster when you have four guys that are busting. And uh, that's kind of how I've always used the labor exchange is to, so I can stand around and chat and pay those guys. And I don't have to go home and be all sore for the next two or three days because that's what happens at my age. Thank you for that exhibit, Mikey. Bruce? Yeah, just real quick, Paul. So, I mean, you know, we're fiduciaries for the residents in terms of spending their money. I, I just think when we get a report on something like this proposal, we ought to have some statistics on, from which we can say this is why we did this. So I really would like to see this come back, even as a consent item, uh, at the next meeting or the meeting thereafter with, with information that would be sufficient to inform the judgment. But as I said before, if three of if three of you want to vote in favor of it now, I'll I'll join in for the sake of harmony. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and vote on it. Is uh, may, will you take the roll, please, Kelsey? Councilmember Pearson. I was gonna say I would accept that <laughs> that uh, change to bring it back as a consent item with the statistics. That wouldn't bother me at all. I think it's actually a fair a fair thing. So I want to accept that. Um, and I don't know who the second was. I don't remember if they would accept that as well. Kelsey, uh, hold on a second. I think Elizabeth may have a, a timing issue. Oh. Well, I, we do need to get back to CDBG um, by January 30th. That's why we typically bring this mm -hmm. item in January. However, if we let them know that it's considering, I mean, it's possible that they would allow us a little more time um, if they know that we had this public hearing. My question to Kelsey is this, this has to be um, determined in a public hearing. If they do want to bring it back, do we need to continue the public hearing so that they can make a decision? John, weigh in if you feel differently, but since we have now conducted the public hearing at this meeting, I believe we could bring back a resolution on a consent calendar at a future meeting. That's correct. The public hearing has been concluded and public comments has been closed. I don't want to bring you back too late and lose it all, and it's just gone. That would be kind of a waste, wouldn't it? I have a hyper-technical, legalistic way in which this might be accomplished, which is that the motion could be, well, first of all, the 15,000, again, I think we could do that tonight anyway, but the motion could be to approve the $98,000 subject to our seeing the numbers and, and having the ability to undo our decision so that we would actually have approved it tonight but with reserving the right to undo it if the statistics don't support continuing to promote that decision. So we would support, we would submit the application, the money would be approved already, and no one's going to complain if we give the money back, which we're probably not going to do anyway. Will you accept that change, Mikey? Uh, I'm looking at Elizabeth to make sure that we're not getting into some area that's just not going to work. Well, How deep my is only the water? Concern now that I understand um, the issue with the public hearing, my only concern would be that um, we do need to 
to submit an adopted resolution regarding the funding. But if that language can be adopted into the resolution, I guess that would be fine. That would be my answer. John, do you have any input on that, what I suggested? Well, I mean, I, I think you can always give the money back if that's the council's pleasure. Uh, I mean, I think she needs, I think she needs an answer by the 30th. So the only other option I see is to hold a special meeting. And I don't know that you want to get together for a special meeting. I think the better approach would be to, if, if it's the council's inclination to, to approve the resolution tonight. Okay, so I go back to my original motion to approve. Okay. So, Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Sure. Mayor Grisanti? An enthusiastic yes. Motion carried. Okay, that takes us to item 6A, which we are going to receive a report on fiscal year 2021-2022 second quarter financial report and mid-year budget amendments. Uh, do we have a staff report? Yes, good evening, Mayor Grisante, members of council, and of course our interim city manager, McClary. It's my pleasure to present to you this evening the second quarter financial report and mid-year budget adjustments for the current fiscal year 21-22. Um, unfortunately, I have lost the ability to see the presentation that Kelsey is uh, projecting. So I'm just going to say next slide. And the slide is numbered one at the bottom of the right corner. She isn't projecting one right now. Parker we're, will get that up for us right now, I'm sure. Yeah, we're not seeing anything. Okay. <laughs> and thank I you have... for your thank oh. you for your patience with me. It's my uh, my first opportunity to to make a formal presentation to you. And and I realize the um, time of day and will be as brief as possible. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so slide uh, next slide, please, Parker. Thank you. As shown on this slide, total revenue for all funds was originally budgeted at approximately 84 million. And through December 31st, the city has received approximately 24 million or about 29%. The proposed mid-year budget adjustments recommended, recommend an increase of 5.66 million um, to increase that total to almost $90 million for all funds. And I'll review the components of this recommendation in just a moment in an upcoming slide. As of note, the total budget revenues include resources to match budgeted costs for phase two of the Civic Center wastewater treatment facility. And this is not changed from the adopted budget. As I understand, an update on this major project is scheduled for the February 28th council meeting. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates revenues for only the general fund, and that was originally budgeted at 38.5 million through December 31st, the city has received approximately 19.7 um, million or about 50%. The proposed mid-year budget amendments recommend an increase again of this 5.66 million, it's all general fund. Um, resources, and that brings the total to 44.2 million. And again, I'll review the components just momentarily. Next slide, please. On slide three, the, these reflect the total expenditures for all funds. Again, originally 92.44 million, and what we've actually ex expended through December 31st is 27% or about 24.5 million. Um, the projected expenditures will be adjusted only after the council's actions this evening to reflect the approved mid-year budget amendments. And um, again, those amendments for uh, this fund will, um, for, excuse me, for all funds will be discussed here in just a moment. We also included a note here at the bottom and same as was in the adopted budget regarding the construction costs for phase two of the Civic Center wastewater treatment facility. And, um, and looking forward to that presentation next month. Next slide, please. For the general fund, the original budget, so this is just the general fund, was approximately 41 million. And through December 31st, our expenditures for general fund are approximately 17 and a half million or about 43%. And again, we'll adjust those projections for the general fund and for all funds um, after the, the council's action this evening. And pardon me if I say the board, I've been saying that for about 17 years. So. I'm, I'm learning to switch gears. 
Uh, next slide, please, slide five. These are the components of the city's cash and investments. And as shown, our cash is held in um, these main three categories, the, city, the city's operating checking account, the, the county, I mean, excuse me, the state's local investment pool, um, we call that LAIF, um, or investments that we hold with Wells, Wells Fargo advisors. And in addition, the city does maintain a small amount of on-site on -site petty cash. Okay, moving on to slide six. This slide provides a summary of the city's fund balances as projected for the end of the current fiscal year um, with a projected undesignated general fund balance of just over $39 million and a total fund balance of almost $60 million. The first quarter financial report that was presented earlier this fiscal year projected the undesignated general fund reserve at almost 37 million, but with the um, year-to-date actuals through the end of the calendar year, through December 31st, we expect the undesignated fund balance um, at 39 million or about 97%, which is obviously a very positive improvement over what was very conservatively um, estimated and then projected with the adopted budget and um, after our books closed. In addition, in response to the economic impacts of COVID-19 and um, the recovery uh, economically and also socially, the city established a 6.5 million designated reserve for operating expenditures of which almost 4 million would have been utilized in the current fiscal year. However, due to the better than expected general fund revenues, it's not necessary to draw down from this designated reserve. Nevertheless, as the continuing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are obviously quite unpredictable, staff does recommend that council maintain the 6.5 million designated reserve for potentially um, helping us uh, step through any potential uh, volatility in our resources in future years. Next slide, please, slide seven. This slide details the multiple components of the revenue amendments included in the agenda materials in your packet for this evening. And I won't describe each one of these items listed, but I do wanna review just the most significant adjustments uh, for the council and for the community. And those are related to property taxes, the documentary transfer tax, transient occupancy taxes, and sales taxes. For property taxes, the projection has been revised upward by a half a million dollars based on the updated information that we've received from the county, which indicates AV growth or assessed valuation growth in excess of original expectations. For documentary transfer taxes, the projection has been revised upward by about $250,000 due to an increased number of property sales, including the sale of one home in Malibu for $177 million. For transit occupancy taxes, the projection has been revised by $750,000 for hotels and motels and um, $2.5 million, the increase, $2.5 million for private rentals. These revisions are based on actual receipts, again, through December 31st, and obviously have greatly exceeded expectations. Um, these ex uh, greater than expected results are due to uh, greater and and activity both for the um, first six months of the fiscal year and also for what's expected for the next six months. We also have the benefit, if you will, of the delay in a hearing from the Coastal Commission on the city's proposed changes to the hosted short-term rental ordinance. This is described in detail on page 10 of the agenda materials, materials for this item. And um, as the council is very well aware, this ordinance referred to as the hosted short-term rental ordinance establishes provisions to regulate short-term property rentals. And when that goes into effect, which again, will only be after the Coastal Commission certifies after a public hearing, when it goes into effect, we will experience a significant reduction in um, these particular uh, revenues. The Coastal Commission has indicated they anticipate to schedule that public hearing on or before June 29th. And so while our what we call TOT revenues um, for private rentals is projected at 5 million total, so again, a 2.5 million increase for 5 million total, 
These revenues will decrease significantly next fiscal year after the ordinance is anticipated to go into effect. Um, unfortunately, we are unable to estimate the impact of the revenue reduction, so we're not taking a stab at it at this time, but we will continue to evaluate and analyze and um, we'll be back to you with any information that we have to further um, uh, project those revenues for next year. Switching gears to sales tax, the projection is revised upward by $1 million. As you may have heard, the state of California has experienced a much stronger economic recovery than was anticipated, and the same holds true for the county of LA and for our city. Um, the fiscal year receipts so far for Malibu are monitored and evaluated in connection with the city sales tax consultant, HDL, and they do that not just so far this fiscal year, but continually uh, for the city, and we meet with them regularly. The projection here reflects a conservative increase um, in that projection based on HDL's analysis. For all the other categories listed, a higher level of analysis was performed. We dug a little deeper. Generally, um, uh, Lisa Sober evaluated the budget revenues as compared to the actual receipts, again, through the end of the calendar year. And if receipts were more than about 70% of the total budgeted amount, um, greater conversations, discussions were had with the um, affected departments and um, the projections are uh, the changes are reflected here. And as you can see, there are a few that actually were um, being suggested to, to be reduced. And, and all of the detail on those descriptions is included in the agenda item. Next slide, please. Slide eight just summarizes the revenue changes uh, with the total proposed revenue budget as reflected um, in the amount of uh, almost 90 million, 89.98 million. Okay, slide nine. Um, on this expenditure slide, the proposed general fund mid-year amendments include all of these items listed here for a total of 770,000. Again, that's for the general fund. The main components are in the areas of street maintenance, which includes the response to the December rains, um, as well as additional funding for services and support of the city's school district unification petition and the compliance costs associated with the dark sky ordinance. Also, the increased activity in the Environmental Services Department is reflected in the budget amendment by adding three full-time positions. Um, I'll describe that here in just a moment on a future slide. But first, I need to mention two important changes that will impact our resources. The first is in the current fiscal year and is mentioned at the bottom of this slide. And then the second impacts the next fiscal year. So it's not particularly mentioned here, but it is included in the agenda materials on page eight. Regarding the first item, the permitting software, the Administration and Finance Subcommittee recommended that Council include an additional $100,000 for the procurement of new permitting software um, and, a, and a whole system, which is not yet reflected in our proposed amendments. Even with this additional $100,000, the proposed expenditure amount, um, expenditure, excuse me, resources are much more than, um, than what is needed to cover uh, the expenditure. So in addition to the reduction of revenues as, as expected from the short-term rental ordinance, um, we will have the increase here and all of the other increases and then some um, other items in the, that are not general fund but we do believe for the current year we're, we're more than covered and next year we'll take those uh, short-term rental re revenue reductions into um, consideration and then also need to take into um, consideration a future expenditure commitment, a major um, commitment associated with the opening of the new sheriff's substation, which is currently in construction. Uh, again, page 10 is a popular page on the agenda items. This is described in detail there. And we do expect to have that construction completed in the fall of 2022. We've been in discussions with the county and the sheriff's department regarding the potential staffing and, of course, the associated increase in costs. It's preliminary, but it is estimated currently that our costs will go up by about $4 million annually or about 10% of our general fund expenditures. And, and this is significant. Um, of course, discussions are ongoing 
I'm sorry. I can only see slide nine. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, we're still on this slide. I'm um, uh, Mayor Grisanti. I did not have a, a separate um, okay. slide for this point. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. It, I just want to mention this, even though it's in a future fiscal year, it's not part of our mid-year okay. budget adjustments. I just want to make sure that we don't walk past the fact that our re our expenditures and our costs for um, the sheriff's department will go up significantly. Right. Wanted to cover. It. Thank you. Okay, slide 10. Um, this is uh, the three positions that I discussed in environmental services, and they will assist in addressing the city's work plan and in meeting the increased level of activity related to two major things. The first being uh, quite, quite major, which is the continuation of the activity uh, for the fire rebuilds. And then we also have a new um, Senate bill, 1383. It imposes new and significant regulations associated with organic waste recycling. And so uh, we'll need to tackle that as well. So as shown here, the positions are permit technician, a building inspector and a sustainability analysis, uh, excuse me, analyst. Next slide, please. Um, this slide summarizes the expenditure changes, and I won't go into any other detail. The total is shown here, and again, 794, 794,000 is for all of our funds, the general fund making up the lion's share. Next slide, next slide please. The adopted budget and proposed amendments reflect resources to achieve the tasks included in the work plan. And again, that was included in detail in your materials. The plan has been amended to address the dark sky ordinance implementation. And in addition, um, we'll need to advertise, notice, do outreach, and we're required to establish and implement permitting requirements for the ordinance, and also required to assess and evaluate the city facilities for compliance with the ordinance. And so these, um, budget amendments do include all of those aspects and they were uh, detailed and, and separated in, in your agenda materials. And then in addition, the work plan will be updated if the council takes action to move forward with the procurement um, and the implementation of permitting software. So we will be sure to include that in our next um, update if the council so chooses to uh, take the administration and finance committee up on their recommendation. Uh, we do believe that the permitting software will better serve our community, have uh, increase our interdepartmental coordination and speed up our permitting process, which I know is a, a concern um, as we have, as I've heard here um, in your meetings for, for quite some time. We also got great news on January 10th that our American Rescue Plan funds can be utilized for this project. And that was received both by uh, from the US Treasury and from the city auditors. And we're very relieved that this initiative is an eligible expenditure. And um, again, we'll amend our, our budget and work plan accordingly uh, with the council's actions. Next slide, please, slide 13. Um, the Administrative and Finance Subcommittee discussed this on January 12th. They reviewed the second quarter financial information and the proposed mid-year budget amendments and are recommending um, the Council's action this evening. Uh, they recommend specifically that the Council approve the fiscal year 21-22 mid-year budget amendments and approve the use of the ARPA funds, the ARPA funds, in the amount of $100,000 um, to jumpstart us on the permitting uh, software system procurement and implementation. And as of note, additional funds will, will be required for the next fiscal year in order to bring that project to fruition. And so we'll bring back a total estimate um, once we dig into it a little more, but it is uh, the total costs are estimated to be north of $600,000. And so we'll make sure to provide the council with those details um, as we uh, dust off the proposal that we received after we did an RFQ. And let's see, and then we'll we'll also update the resolution if that's the council's actions this evening. Okay, slide 14. So from this point forward, this is my last slide, I am excited to launch into, I already have to a certain extent, the budget development process. We'll start out with our grant applications that are due in March. We will work toward um, a budget presentation uh, to the council, to the, excuse me, the ANF committee um, uh, in May and uh, follow up with additional, um, not just discussions, but a public hearing with the council and then hopefully adopt um, in June. 
thank you so much for your time and your patience. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Liz, um, Elizabeth Shavelson, Renee Nierman, and all of the staff in the finance department, as well as my colleagues for their patience with me and following, um, following through with my requests for their time. And of course, the council for uh, your dedication and diligence as well. And of course, if you have any uh, questions, we're here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. I believe it's appropriate for us to now have public comments. Do we have any public members of the public? We don't have any speakers signed up for this item, and I don't see any raised hands from the public in Zoom. So if that concludes Wonderful. public comment. So that takes us to council and comments, and I see Bruce followed by Karen. Well, I just want to thank Ruthie. Do you go by Ruthie or Ruth? What, what is your preference? I go by Ruthie, but okay. legally, my name is Ruth. <laughs> I want to thank you for a very easily understandable and thorough um, presentation, especially on your first first one out there out of the box. Um, I'm sure that Lisa also contributed to getting this done as her gift as she left, so we probably should thank her too. Um, so I, the only the only comment I have is, um, I, are there more things we can be doing to tap into the ARPA funds? You know, more things that we need done that instead of spending our money, we can be spending Uncle Sam's money. <laughs> Absolutely. And that actually is a top of my list is to um, dig a little deeper into the not just um, the uh, set asides thus far, but also um, the, the initiatives that are uh, top of mind and priority for the council. And if we can match those resources with the priorities of the council, that's the best use of them. So we'll, we'll make sure to call that out uh, in a future presentation. Okay, well, thank you once again. Karen? Yeah, Ruthie, I also want to say thank you um, to you, to everybody on the team, Elizabeth, uh, Renee, Joni, and I know Lisa had a lot to do with this as well, so I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and I want to thank uh, the ANF committee uh, for the addition of the uh, kickstart on the permitting software. That's something that's been lacking for a long time in the city. Uh, Mikey and I brought this up very shortly after we got elected. We were told that there were no funds to pursue it at the time. I'm really happy to see that we're in a position to do that now. Uh, and I know it's gonna require more to implement, but that's a great, great addition uh, to, uh, to our mid-year budget. So I, I just wanna thank everybody for that. I'd like to join in singing the uh praises of what you've done and how it's your team has done and how you presented it and it's very easy to understand and I appreciate that thank you very much uh, Steve thank you mayor and members of the council I just wanted to make a couple of real quick comments um, just to echo some of the uh, things that Ruthie said here it, it's hard to find any real bad news here. Uh, it was it was quite a good turnaround. Uh, I think we're some some wise choices were made, not knowing what was coming in the future there. Um, but just a couple words of caution, as always. You know, much much like what we've seen with the state budget, which uh, they're looking at record surpluses. Um, you know, it's very likely that this is somewhat of a bubble and not likely to last. Uh, particularly if you look at, you know, how incredibly well we did uh, in areas like sales tax uh, and, and the short term rentals. And of course, Ruthie noted that, uh, you know, that could be, you know, reduced in the future, depending on what happens at the, at the Coastal Commission with that. So there are still some things coming down uh, to, I would say, to, to temper any potential, you know, exuberance. Um, and we don't think things are going to take a, a radical downturn. Obviously we're very solid in the property tax area, um, but, but I would just say I would, would not expect that, you know, this level of acceleration to necessarily continue. Um, so, and I just also wanted to, to, to thank Ruthie as well. Uh, she has uh, jumped in uh, uh, with a big job here and has uh, handled things uh, uh, very, uh, smoothly and uh, seamlessly. Uh, so thank her for that. Uh, also, of course, wanted to acknowledge and thank Lisa Soaker as well. Her fingerprints are all over this as part of her final act to the city. But uh, 
thank you to to Ruthie and the team for uh, for bringing this to the finish line. And I know we are in, in good hands there. Um, I also just want to make a comment that uh, we are going to be rolling up our sleeves uh, and taking a close look at what we can possibly uh, capitalize from the state and, and federal budgets. Uh, we heard that noted several times this evening, uh, both by public speakers and members of the council. Uh, and it is definitely higher on our radar screen. Uh, there are some opportunities out there. Not every grant fund is, is necessarily going to be available to Malibu, but there there are some things that I think we need to uh, check and see what might be applicable here. Um, uh, in fact, I, we talked about highway beautification right now. The state of California uh, has a, a highway beautification program that they has, have just launched. Uh, and I know we're trying to try to see if we can get some funds uh, for, for public art for that. Um, anyways, that was just, I just wanted to make a few comments uh, before we went on with the rest of the agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager McClary. Steve Uring. Uh, Ruthie, thank you, you did good. Uh, and just so the council understand, in the Ed, in Administrative and Finance Committee, we took a look at some possible changes we can make to increase the revenue sources for upcoming years. So they'll be coming back to you a little bit later. I think, I think Steve's comments that said, you know, this may be a little bit of a bubble and we've got some additional costs coming up in the upcoming years. We have to make sure we got covered. And we think some of these new potential revenue sources we took a look at may help us do that. So that we, that'll be coming back to us sometime in the near future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, this is a receive and file. Or do we need a motion of any kind? I'll make a motion to receive and file and, and also echo all the thanks to the entire team. Thank you very much, Ruthie and team. Really, really appreciate it. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mayor Grisanti, the recommend action included receive and file the adoption of a resolution. Um, and also I think staff is looking for some direction to add the, I believe it's the dark sky ordinance implementation and permitting software procurement to the work plan. Ruthie, did Isn't I Isn't that out? what Mikey just said? That, that's exactly what I said. I was swearing <laughs> word for word. I... <laughs> and the resolution includes the $100,000 for permitting software procurement. I know yes. I said that, didn't I? Sure. Yes. We're very enthusiastic about that. Excellent. Thank you, Kelsey. And the second, Bruce, that was what you meant, wasn't it? I understood Mikey to say all those things, and that was what I was seconding. All right. Uh, Kelsey, can you take the roll now, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Thank Motion you very much. Roll. That brings us to the final uh, item for tonight, oh. which. Pardon sorry. me? I thought we were done. I'm sorry. No, item 6B. Mid-year commission activity reports. Uh, do we have a staff report? Yes, Mayor and Council. So uh, as part of the mid-year budget, we typically bring uh, updated um, uh, reports to you uh, on, the, on the work plan, the commission work plan. So this is before you uh, as a receive and file this evening. Happy to answer any questions. We do have the department heads here, I believe online, if you have any specific questions about the work that the commissions are doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any members of the public? Yes, we have Lottie Sharon signed up to speak and I see she is still in the meeting. Let's get Lottie on the, to have her speak to us. Hey. <laughs> hey Lottie, how are you? I'm I'm still awake. How are you? <laughs> well, I'm awake too. Yay! Rosie well, woke us up a little bit. There you go. Um, thanks for letting me speak about this. I, uh, as chair of the Arts Commission, I wanted to propose some um, items for the work plan coming up. I didn't see any of that listed on, you know, the 2021 plan that was submitted. Um, what I'd like to propose are things that we've discussed in the Arts Commission, and all commissioners are strongly on board with each of these items. Uh, uh, the items were also part of the original Arts Task Force, 
report, which was presented to the city many, many years ago, at, prior even to the uh, creation of the commission. I'd like to propose that we uh, have on our work plan an artist in residence program for the city. Uh, I, I can give you salary amounts uh, and finance on all of this if you like, but right now I'll just give you the items. That's the first one. The second one is uh, I'd like to propose that we have a professional arts consultant that works with us directly rather than uh, community services. I know those guys, their whole team, they're great, but they're very overworked and they don't have enough staff. And we would really like to have a professional arts person work with us directly so we can implement some of our, uh, some of the things we wanna get done. And the final thing is we wanna get the uh, Malibu Arts Center on board again. I know it was part of our plan in the past. I don't know why it was eliminated. It should definitely be back on there. Everybody wants to see an art center here. The city has uh, owns land. They can rent it to us for a buck a year. We can find funding. There's a lot of support for this in the city and a lot of people that would be, you know, gladly support it. So that's my, uh, that's my request. Also, I think your, your current city manager, Mr. McClary, has experience in setting up an art center at the, you know, in the past. And I would love to meet with him uh, and uh, a commissioner or two to see if we could find out details from his point of view and get this thing moving. Anyway, that's my, that's my request and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lottie. And Mayor Grisanti, I don't have any other speakers or any raised hands, so that concludes public comment. So it's appropriate at this time for us to have council comments and discussion. And I don't see any hands raised. So, Mikey, thank you for answering the call. I couldn't push the buttons quick enough. Um, I, I do want to discuss um, some of what is being discussed involving an art center. I, I think it should be on the work plan, not to take up staff time necessarily, but especially because it's it's a really difficult project. A number of us have tried working on it. And Karen and I have had meetings on it for a number of years. It's really hard. You just, you just got to get a lead and chase it down. And I would like our arts commissioners to feel like they can do that. And, um, because they're probably be the ones that maybe stumble into the right connection that leads us down the right path. And plus, we're going to have um, the ability to have um, some sort of art presence, art, art, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired, art presentations, um, performances, et cetera, at the new SMC campus. And they're the perfect group to be involved in those conversations, I, I've had them a number of times with the team doing it, and they've st stuck by it, that that's an important part of it to them, um, that they want, you know, performance space, which, you know, something that could happen quicker than pretty much any other area that I'm aware of that's uh, upcoming. So I definitely uh, agree with that. I did discuss with Jesse some of the item, other items that uh, Lottie brought up, and I, I love them all. I know that... Um, I'm kind of feeling like right now I I felt like it's just running into a bit of a, you know, how much different things can we do right now? The, the staff issues, I don't know if it's so much a money issue, um, but I'm, I'm interested in those items as well. But I also know that, you know, we just don't have this point. So I'm being sensitive to my comments at the moment. Okay. Mr. Yurain. Uh Yeah, uh, I don't disagree with anything Mikey just said. I, the, the comment we got when we talked about this in administrative and finance was from the staff perspective, they were they didn't want to get overburdened with more stuff coming at them. So Lottie, I mean, I don't know, is Lottie still there? Are you still She's still there. Lottie? Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, if we put these things on on the work plan, do you think the committee will be able to handle most of those, or, or you know, I, I'd, I'd hate to get them lost by someplace if, by not putting them, not having them visible. 
uh, but I do not want to burden or bury the, the rest of the staff doing that. Do you, you think you got a way to manage that if we do that? Yes, absolutely. And, and to respond to Mikey, I have contacted um, your, your crew about trying to get a, a available space in the new uh, SMC campus. And I've been blocked at every turn. All I know is they have a place for some sort of community something and they also have a yoga room, but they have nothing for the arts, nothing specific for the arts. There's no funding set aside for the arts. You know, we have something like $30,000. The rest of it is all staff. Okay, it looks like we have a huge budget. We don't. We can get going on this, but even when we bring it up in our meetings, we're told we can't talk about it because it's not on our agenda. It's not a part of our work plan which is ridiculous. We need to be able to discuss these things and everybody wants to see this happen. So I, you know, I'm all on board with this. We've been trying to do this for more than 10 years. I don't know what Mikey and Karen have, have done. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I wish I did because we've been pushing this for a long time. Um, well, let me respond to that quickly. Lottie, I hear your frustration and I understand it, absolutely. I can help connect with SMC because um, I've talked to them several times, but they actually every so often have a, a meeting that crops up. And I was telling Barry today that I want him at that meeting next time. It's mm -hmm. been a while since we had one, but I'm sure there'll be another one coming up. Um, and somehow, yeah. So anyhow, I'll be looking for that. And um, Karen and I have, you know, just hunted down leads over the years from people that had potentially, you know, property available or money or a plan and, and obviously nothing came to fruition. Um, you know, a lot of the lots people want to build something or do something, it's just not possible. So, um, I mean, maybe Karen can elaborate on that. But yeah, we've been out there um, and, you know, doing what we can, mostly before COVID, to be honest. I mean, COVID's kind of put a, shut a lot of things down, including that for me. But uh, um, yeah, I that's why I, I do think Arch Center should be on the plan, absolutely. So that you know that those that you can form a subcommittee, maybe or whatever, makes sense for your commission, and um, and pursue leads and ideas and talk to people. Um, absolutely, that that to me makes perfect sense. Thank you, Mikey. Karen. Uh, yeah, I want to thank Lottie. We this this is something that's been talked about for years I agree um, the trick is figuring out how to get there um, and I'm really happy to know that uh, you and the rest of the uh, cultural arts committee is uh, commission is is as interested as you are um, I definitely don't want to get in the way of that uh, I want to be sensitive as well to um, the staff uh, capacity um, I'm not exactly sure how to authorize or how much we can authorize you all to do, but I'd say go for it. Talk to people, um, Mikey and I, and, and I'm sure all the council members will, will gladly uh, engage any constituent or anybody to know on this conversation. Um, some of us know know some of the members of the Santa Monica College community better than others. Uh, I think the mayor is the designated representative to those meetings. Is that right, Paul? I don't think so because I haven't been invited to one yet. Well, there, there may I not have you been are. one. I think but you I think, are. I think you are. Um, okay. Um, maybe it's mayor and mayor pro tem. Um, we can find that out easily. I believe um, it's mayor and mayor pro tem. Okay. Um, and maybe there just hasn't been a meeting. There is, uh, my understanding, um, a nice theater that's in the Santa Monica College building. I don't know what we need to do to get access to it, uh, but we definitely should ask. I'm happy to do that tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, the the more we ask, the, the 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 more we'll get there. So anyway, Lottie, I just want to thank you, and and I'm making myself some notes of some phone calls I'm going to make tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Bruce. 
Yeah, so I, I think we're talking about the Malibu Public Facilities Group, um, and there was a meeting, because uh, it was my first time I ever attended, it was about a month ago. The next one is scheduled for March, March 16th at 1 p.m., so maybe get on that, you know, ask to be invited to that meeting. Um, Steve, you, I'm sure you have the um, meeting particulars. Maybe we can get somebody on that meeting from the Arts um, Commission and begin a dialogue at that meeting. Okay. So if, if we agree to let Lottie put all those three items on her work plan and let her work with her commissioners to figure out how to do that without impacting the staff, is that where we're going? You know, if you have somebody who's willing to do a lot of work and, and without a lot of money, it's hard to say no. Uh, I'm really excited about the possibility of uh, renting them the land or some land to build an arts center on. Of course, that's going to take some a while to come up with a design that actually meets our codes and then get financing lined up for that. But uh, if you go around in Beverly Hills or Santa Monica, there's a lot of buildings that have somebody's name on them a, a donor's name on them and there's there's no reason we shouldn't try to harness that in malibu as well i think if if you can get uh people have talked about an aquatic center people have talked about an art center these these are things that are public goods and and i would think that people would want to have their name associated with them karen i see your hand um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge, um, Paul, you mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, and I, I want to reiterate, I have not, and I don't think the council has lost sight of the fact that we all acknowledge there needs to be a public outreach process to talk about uh, constituents' priorities. Uh, that was promised uh, emphatically when the three properties were purchased from the Malibu Bay Company in September of 2018. So I just wanna make sure that we're noting that we've not lost sight of that. We're not just running with this idea uh, and, and disregarding previous promises. And, and I think that community outreach is absolutely critical. I know that does involve staff uh, time and, and um, uh, staff capacity, and, and I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to how to put that together and how to manage that, but I don't want that to go unsaid. Thank you, Karen. Okay, Steve, you're in. So I'll make Sorry. a motion. I'll make a motion to. Have Lottie put those, add those three items to her commission's work plan and just ask her to try and have a minimal impact on the staff as she works her way through some of those things. But I think the more we can get people thinking about that, the better chance we're going to have of getting something done. So I'll second that. Okay. I'm sorry, Mayor and Councilmember Uring. Can we identify which three items those were? I thought at one point Lottie had also discussed adding a staff position. So we'd need some more direction to come back with that. Uh, the three items I had written down were artist in residence, professional arts consultant. They're doing an investigation of these things and a, a Malibu Arts Center. Right, that's what I had. Okay, and uh, Steve, we're good with adding that based on that language to the work plan? Yes. I think we might, we might have to recognize if we're exceeding staff capacity, something else might have to come off. So we have to be aware that that's a possibility. I talked to Jesse about this and, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty maxed out. So let's be careful here is all I'm saying. You know, I definitely want the commissioners to pursue the um, art center. The other items we have to, you know, I, I, I just don't want to implode somewhere there, but I know the, and, you know, how anxious everyone is to do more and I totally get it and I'm with it, but a little worried about staff capacity, to be honest. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you. And that, that basically is what I was going to mention. So thank you so much. So it was a big concern. It was discussed at A&F and um, it, it, with base, the thoughts exactly as was just described. So it's a, it's a tough, uh, tough um, endeavor without the addition of, of staff and community services. Well, can we modify those items to them coming back to us with some idea of what they're talking about as far as the dollars for an artist in residence, a professional arts consultant, and uh, for the Malibu Arts Center, I think what they're trying to do is figure out the uh, how it could possibly be done and whether or not there are actually some donors around who would step up. Is that an extra? I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, uh, you know, I think we're overly reliant on staff for a lot of things that we don't need to be. And I wonder whether there couldn't be some coordinated effort between the commission, the formal commission, and a privately created group of residents who are interested in pursuing this idea who could do the the work of running with it and then bringing it back when they've got some kind of concrete proposal, which would avoid the, the, the issue of needing a staff person to be involved, kind of like we used to do with the homeless working group before we created a task force. So it's just, just a thought is, you know, we probably could offload if we've got interested residents who want to pursue something, we don't need to be make these things staff dependent. So you're suggesting that we uh, ask them to appoint a two person subcommittee to go out and interface with some members of the public and try to come up with a plan. Sounds like the governmental way to explain what I just said. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> you know, I like the process of letting Lottie Chiron and her commissioners figure out how, how to execute the plan Bruce just talked about. I mean, you know, they've got connections in, there's, there's Lottie, she's been doing this for a long time. Uh, Peter uh, has been doing this stuff for a long time. They probably got more connections than we know about. So I think let them try. Let's see what we we can always take something off if we if we end up you know getting log jammed someplace. But give them a chance to go out and do what they want to do and see how how they do with it. Uh, you know you got to let people try. And if they, it's a problem, you know let them try. They often come up with stuff that you didn't think they were going to get done. I don't know what that does to the motion, but uh... Uh, just the motion stays the same. And then Lottie, Lottie figures out how to make it work. Lottie and her, and her team. Why don't you make that piece of it explore ways to pursue an art zone? Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll accept that. That's a good idea. Okay. So can we have a vote? And one more point to clarify in this motion, are we also receiving filing the activity report? as stated in the yes, recommendation. Yes, we are. Yeah. Excellent. Council Member Yuri? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I suddenly saw some raised hands pop up. Yes. Oh, Council Member Yuri, Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carried. Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Will you take the roll, please? Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes, and thank you, Lottie. Motion carries and you are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Um...